The great outdoors is a daunting place to make your home. When farmers settle down in distant pastures, they're really making a gamble. A life of peace and nature, sunlight and land, versus the terrors that lurk just beyond the trees. The following is a big compilation of terrifying and allegedly true stories that happened on farms, previously told on my shows. If you have a scary story that happened in the great outdoors, send it to me at darkstories.org so I can share it with the world on this podcast, Outdoor Terrors. If you like what you hear, follow and rate Outdoor Terrors on Spotify and Apple. Thank you. Now throw a log on the fire, because the night is still young. It came with the fog from Double D. Thirteen years ago, I was going through the worst period of my life. All possible misfortunes just followed one after the other. It all started when my husband left me for another woman and kicked me out of our home. Then I was one of the first to get fired when my company, where I spent over 10 years, ran into financial problems. When I thought that was the end of it, one night I fell asleep behind the wheel, ran off the road, and destroyed my already miserable car, the repairs of which I paid literally the last money I had. I ended up alone in a small, ugly apartment that I was renting, crying and feeling sorry for myself. Most of the people I considered friends turned their backs on me and left me alone at the mercy of my depression that had me tightly in its claws. My wake-up call was when I realized I would soon be homeless if I continued like this much longer. That's when I decided it was enough. I didn't need anyone and I would get back on my feet. Since I'm a prisoner of a small, dying but once very lively mining town, I was in no position to choose the job I liked. I had to accept what was offered at the time. So I agreed to a new job at a nearby dairy farm. The job description was this, preparing and taking cows for milking and other related tasks. It's not something you fantasize about as a little girl, but when you're desperate and need money, unfulfilled childhood dreams are the least of your worries. Plus, the job wasn't bad at all. It just took a little bit of time to get used to the sounds, smells, and other charms a farm has to offer. One day, my boss gathered us all together, asking if any of us would be willing to work the night shift until he hired someone new for the job. Before he could even finish the question, I had my hand in the air. Changing tonight meant that I would get a better salary for way less work. Basically, all I would have to do is be physically present and make sure that everything was in order, that the cows were alive and undisturbed. If something really did happen, I could just call the boss, and if a pregnant cow went into labor, I could just call the vet. And that was that. Although the boss wasn't too thrilled with the idea since no one else came forward, he didn't have much choice. Honestly, the first few nights I wasn't comfortable being alone on that farm, but after I got over my fear, I started to really enjoy the place and the fresh night air. My boss planned my duties so that when I arrived, I would settle in a small, well, let's call it an office, and every once in a while, I would take a walk around the place to see if everything was okay. During one of those walks, a genius idea hit me, which I very quickly put into action. I made a small fortress out of hay bales, and instead of being in the office, I was chilling in my new spot. Most of the time, I would read books with a small headlamp, and the best part was that I didn't have to walk anymore, because in case something happened, I would hear everything from my little fortress. One night, just as I was starting a new book, footsteps began to echo in the dead silence of the farm. Loud, specific footsteps that I knew immediately where they were coming from. In front of one of the barns was a large patch of dirt, and at the moment, there was a bunch of mud there. The kind of mud that would torture you fairly well before letting you go through it. I could hear a splash, splash, 
there was no doubt someone was in front of the barn. I wasn't really scared. I expected to find someone from a nearby town trying to steal some oil from one of the mini machines, and I would just tell them to go away before calling the police. It was only when I peeked out from my fortress when I noticed a thick fog had begun to cover every corner of the farm. I bravely started making my way towards the unknown intruder, but to my surprise, there was no one there. It wasn't possible for someone to run away that quickly. As I said, that thick mud does not let go easily. I should have either found someone there, or at least heard them desperately attempting to get out of the mud. Confused and slightly doubting my own ears, I went back to my position and listened carefully. All I heard was silence. I decided to call my brother, because at the time he was in the phase of hardcore gaming and I knew he'd be awake still. I needed to hear a familiar voice. I needed a logical explanation to calm me down a bit. Of course, he told me it was probably nothing, that I was just tired and that my brain was playing tricks on me. He said if someone was really there by now, I would have heard something else. Fully relieved by my brother's words, I went back to my book. I don't know exactly how much time passed, but judging by the pages I read, I would say at least an hour or two, when the silence was disturbed once more. This time, not by footsteps echoing through the farm, but rather a totally unknown, eerie, and somewhat irritating sound that I would best describe as gargling and slurping, somehow at the same time. I didn't dare to move as the sound was coming closer and closer, then stopped right in front of my little fortress. I stayed there like a statue, my heart in my throat, and a disgusting, bitter taste filling my mouth. I had absolutely no idea what to do. Yeah, yeah I, guess I guess you're right. You're right. Maybe, Maybe we can hang out tomorrow. Out tomorrow. Well, well, then give me a call when you wake up. I love you. Those were the words that woke me up from my trance. Those were my words. That was my voice because that's exactly what I'd said to my brother on the phone earlier. When it finally hit me that the footsteps I heard were in fact real, that they belonged to this whatever the thing was, that all this time I'd been convincing myself I was alone on the farm, this thing was hidden somewhere nearby, and that it was now speaking to me in my voice, and the only thing standing between us was a single bell of hay. I jumped out of my fortress like a bullet, and ran into the night, praying to God that I didn't get lost while trying to find my car in the thickest fog I've ever seen. It didn't take me too long to find the car. When I made it, I just sat down, locked myself in, and desperately tried to put the key in the ignition with trembling hands. I then felt and heard something brush against the car. I managed to start the car, and more than anything I wanted to press in the gas, but because of the darned fog, I was forced to move at a crawling pace, and the entire time I could feel light pushes and hear tapping on the back window of the car. I'm not sure when it all stopped, because I was crying and sobbing so loud it was all I could hear at that point. When I felt I'd driven far enough, I called my boss and I tried to explain what happened but I don't think I managed to say a single word that made sense, and he had no idea what happened or what I was even talking about. But by then, I didn't care. I just wanted to go home and hide under a blanket. In the morning when I heard my phone ring, I immediately knew it was my boss calling, that he would want to see me, and that I would likely get fired. But first, I would be forced to listen to his speech about how I shouldn't have pushed myself for a job that I wasn't ready to do. But I was wrong. He wasn't mad at all, and I soon found out that the horror story didn't end with me running away from the farm. After my crazy call, my boss came to the farm and tried to find out what had happened. However, due to the thick fog, the only thing he could do was go around the barns. And one of them, he found a dead cow. 
At first glance, nothing strange. It happens, unfortunately. Except, this was one of the pregnant cows, and her belly had been ripped open, the abdominal cavity completely empty. No calf, not a single organ, not a drop of blood, a stain, a print, no sign of a struggle. Nothing. Just a dead animal, surrounded by dozens of other cows that were now calmly munching on hay and didn't seem the least bit upset. How is it possible to walk among so many animals, tear open one's belly, take out so much content in total silence, then walk away without leaving any trace? Although I was returned back to my milking job, my financial situation was still bad, so I didn't last long there. I've never believed in the paranormal before. I've never been a person that gets easily scared. But that night changed everything for me. I didn't feel comfortable working when I knew that maybe I was being watched by something that was just waiting for the right moment to grab me. Then, instead of a cow, I would be left dead found with a torn open belly, completely empty on the cold, dirty floor. The Husband's Horse From K.L. This is my husband's story. He is a professional farrier, or a horse shoer, for those of you that aren't around horses much. Now, being a farrier, he's been to the entire spectrum of different locations to take care of clients' horses, some took him to beautiful places that you would picture in a magazine. Others have been extremely run down, barely standing sheds. When he gets called from new clients, he's usually able to look them up on Facebook first to get an idea of what he's going to be dealing with. But some of the older generations that contact him just have a landline, so he's got to go in blind. This is one of those stories. It will be told from his perspective. My job has a lot of factors that can either make my day truly enjoyable or make it the longest gut-wrenching experience. Since I mostly work outside, the weather greatly affects my job. When it's hot out, I deal with clingy flies and heat exhaustion. When it's cold, I deal with grumpy clients having to stand in the cold holding their horse while I work on its feet. If the horse doesn't stand well, that makes my job all the more challenging. But the absolute worst part of my job is having to deal with people on a daily basis. Most are completely normal, but I've also had my fair share of the not-so-normal horse owners. This story by far is the most unnerving and creepiest scenario I've ever dealt with, and it definitely shows the dark side of poor mental health. This took place during the winter in Colorado. I received a call from an elderly woman late one evening. She asked if I could come take a look at her horse that wasn't getting any better after having a few other farriers come out to work on him. I asked her where she was located, and she gave me an address. It worked out that she was in an area I was going to be close to in a few days. I cover a three-hour radius from my home, and she was about an hour and a half away. I told her I could work her in at the end of the day on my way home, and then I asked if she had a barn we could work in, since it would be dark by the time I'd get there. She told me she had a very nice large barn that had electricity and a large heater in it. I thought, great, this one will be a piece of cake. We agreed on the date and approximate time, and she gave me step-by-step -step directions to get to her place, as the closest small town was about 20 miles away. In other words, she was in the middle of nowhere, but that wasn't anything unusual for me. The day came and I finished up my previous appointments, and I started heading in the direction of her place on my way home. It was snowing hard by that point, and I was really looking forward to that nice warm barn that she said she had. I pulled off the interstate, and I started going down country roads. I was keeping an eye on my odometer, to make sure I didn't miss any turns, as I had no cell phone reception. Before long, I finally saw a sign that read farmhouse with an arrow, indicating the last turn that she had instructed me to make. About a mile and a half later, I came to a ranch at the end of a dead-end road. 
I thought. No, this couldn't be the right place. There was a little farmhouse and a big barn, but everything was completely dilapidated, run down. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. I sat there rereading the directions she gave me, thinking, well, crap, am I really going to have to drive 20 miles back to town to get reception just to give this woman a call? That's when I saw this tiny little hunched over old woman walking through the snow in a nightgown, winter coat, and work boots. She carried what looked to be a lantern. What in the world? I thought. I climbed out of my truck and approached her. She happily greeted me, asking if I had any trouble finding the place. I followed her as she led me to the entrance of her barn. We talked for a couple of minutes as she explained again what she and her husband thought was wrong with the horse. I listened to her, suggesting a couple of options. She interrupted me at that point, asking that I address her husband when speaking. I was taken aback. I looked around, thinking maybe her husband had come up behind me, and I didn't hear him because of the blowing snow. But there was no one else there. I looked at the woman and said, Um, your husband? She replied, Yes, please don't ignore him. My stomach dropped. What the heck did I walk into, I thought. Now, I've dealt with some people that are pretty far out there. She didn't seem to pose a threat, and honestly, at this point, she wasn't the craziest person I've dealt with. I apologized to her and played along. She told me it was fine and began to lead me towards one of the stalls in the barn. Finally getting a better look at her barn, I came to the realization that not only was there no electricity, but the big heater was actually an antique wood-burning stove buried under four inches of dirt and dust. She motioned me over to the stall she was standing closest to. I walked over to the stall door. I could see there was a horse on the ground towards the back of the stall, in the shadows, but the light from her lantern didn't penetrate the darkness enough to see clearly. I pulled my phone out, turning on the flashlight, and I started to shine it inside the stall. My heart stopped, blood running cold, my flashlight had landed on a horse in the stall, but that horse was dead. And it had been dead for a long, long while. It was past the point of smelling bad. All that was left was basically hide and bones in the shape of a horse. It was still wearing a halter, and sat in front of this long dead horse was fresh hay and a full bucket of clean water. By then, I was doing my best not to soil myself. Was this a setup? I thought. Was someone going to jump out from one of the other stalls and try to kill me? My mind raced with every horrifying answer that popped into my head. I looked back at the old lady. My breath caught in my throat as I looked around searching for anyone else that could be there. She stood there, calmly holding her lantern, looking at me. Then she asked, What do you think we can do for him? I was stupefied. I looked at her, then back at the horse, as she waited patiently for an answer. I about jumped out of my skin when I heard movement further back in the barn. I shone my light towards the noise, and I saw eyes shine from two other horses. I walked closer to them, discovering two very old horses that were extremely emaciated, hooves so long they were curling up like elf shoes. This was extreme neglect. These horses were starving to death, knocking on death's door at that very moment, and this lady was giving a horse that had been expired for who knows how long clean water and fresh hay. I couldn't wrap my head around it, Every cell in my body was screaming for me to get the heck out of there. I turned back to the old lady, asking if she was talking about these horses. She grew irritated and snapped at me. No, I'm wanting to know what we can do to help my husband's horse right here, swinging the lantern towards the dead one. My mind was blown 
I had no idea what the heck was going on, but I felt like I needed to tread lightly with this woman. After all, we were out in the middle of nowhere during a large snowstorm, and I had zero cell reception. She seemed like a frail, little old lady, but who knew if there was a shotgun stashed somewhere close by or if anyone else was hiding there? In my experience, and having relatives that lived far off the beaten path, those were the people you didn't mess with. I stood silent, trying to hide the panic I was feeling. Finally, I blurted out a routine answer for a client of a horse that needed corrective work. <clears throat> so, uh, what I'm going to need you to do is call a vet and uh, get me some x-rays on this horse. I want to see what's going on inside his foot before we do any sort of corrective work. Once you get those x-rays, I'll have the vet email me the images. Then I'll head back out here and get them fixed up. She looked to her left and asked, Does that sound good? I'm assuming she was asking her husband. She waited a couple of seconds, then said to me, smiling, Yes, yes, we think that is a good plan. Thank you. I will get a hold of our vet first thing in the morning. How much do I owe you for coming out? I was already starting to walk towards my truck to get the heck out of Dodge. I yelled back over my shoulder. Uh, no charge. I'll be in touch with you after I hear back from the vet. Then we'll schedule another visit. I started my rig and threw it into drive. I hauled tail out of there, trying to remember the way back to the interstate. I kept replaying the whole interaction in my head. Did all that really just happen? As soon as I had reception, I put in a call to the county sheriff and I started to explain the situation to him. He asked if it was Mrs. A on County Road X, like he wasn't even surprised at all. I was floored. Uh, yeah, yes sir, that's her, I told him. Do you think she needs a welfare check? He explained I was the third farrier to call about her, but apparently I was the first to tell anyone about the two emaciated horses that she had in the back of her barn. Apparently, I had stayed much longer than the others who had been called out there. He told me point blank that he would not send anyone out to her place, as he already had multiple times in the past. I was getting the vibe that it would be difficult to find anyone willing to go out there and deal with her. I was frustrated, persistent that I was concerned about her and those horses. I told him that she was talking to her husband who was clearly not there, that I thought she needed help. Those two other horses would surely die if nobody stepped in. He stopped me, took a deep breath, and explained that years earlier, before he was the sheriff, her husband had disappeared and was assumed dead, although his body was never found. It was speculated by neighbors and people in town that she had something to do with it. After his disappearance, she went off the deep end and never really got over it. This little old lady lived out there alone in the middle of nowhere, talking to her dead husband, taking care of his dead horse. I never did hear from her again. I have no idea if a vet ever did go out there to x-ray her dead horse. I did make a call to the local humane society, trying to get those two living horses some help. I never heard anything back from that either. It's been four years since this happened, and I still think of her every time I'm close to that exit on the interstate. Part of me wants to go see if she's still alive, but every time I consider it, I get full-body goosebumps remembering that whole bizarre encounter. I hope she somehow was able to get the help she clearly needed. That entire scenario is truly heartbreaking. Something was outside. From in gone another account. Just out of college, my friend, who we call Livewire due to an old joke, didn't have a lot of money. So his aunt and uncle who lived on a farm let him stay in a shed on the property until he got his own house. This shed was a stable place, 
just on the edge of the property near a thicket of trees, resulting in bad Wi-Fi service, of course. However, Livewire wasn't bothered by that and was more than thankful for the place. He said it was very peaceful and would often boast to our friend group about how perfect it was and how they had to come over and see it. At the time, Livewire had been in the shed for about three weeks. Before long, my boyfriend, Cole, gave in and decided to spend a week with Livewire. According to Cole, it was a pretty neat place. The shed was well built, had electricity, heaters, a fan, a kitchen, and a bathroom. The service wasn't as bad as the Wi-Fi, but it wasn't great. Livewire even managed to hook up his PlayStation to the TV. After Cole arrived and unpacked his stuff, the two of them went for a walk in the woods to a nearby pond, where they spent the afternoon swimming and fishing. By the time they started to head back, it was dark, and as cliche as it sounds, the woods went quiet. This put Cole on edge right away, but Livewire laughed at his tense friend. They walked a bit further, until they reached the shed. As Livewire went to unlock the door, they heard this coyote-like howl. Cole turned to Livewire, his face as white as a ghost. Did you hear that? Cole asked. Livewire laughed. What? Just a coyote call? That was no coyote call, Cole said. The call was strange, slow and drawn out. Livewire unlocked the door and pushed it open. Cole, it was just a coyote call. I've heard them every night. No need to be paranoid. Cole tried to listen to his friend as they went to play the PlayStation, but he could hear that one low, drawn-out call again. It sounded as if someone recorded that phantom howl, playing it back repeatedly. Around 11 p.m., the boys decided to head to bed. Cole still couldn't sleep, and the silence of the woods was unsettling. Soon, Livewire's snoring echoed through the shed, and after that, the howling started again. This happened for the first two nights. On the third night, however, was when everything went awry. At around 2 a.m., Livewire was asleep, but Cole had awakened, feeling hot with a racing heart. He went to the bathroom and washed his face. Of course, the woods were silent again. Cole went to the fan at the end of the bed. He was about to turn it on, then he froze. The coyote call came again. He'd grown accustomed to the sound, but this one was close, too close. It sounded like the coyote was right outside the shed. The howl came again. Cole turned the fan on, walking to the window just behind the beds. He didn't see anything. The call came once more, and it sounded even closer. Cole, quietly but quickly, got into the bed, pulling the covers up over his head, leaving only his eyes exposed. The howling was so loud now that Cole was sure Livewire would wake up any second. After one loud and extended howl, everything fell silent, except for Livewire's snoring and the gentle hum of the fan. A few minutes passed like this before Cole heard heavy footsteps on the gravel outside the shed. He slowly lifted his head out from under the covers, just enough to peer out. There, illuminated by the full moon, was the shadow of a muscular, hairy figure with large ears standing on two legs. Cole did not dare look behind him to see what was casting that shadow from the window. Time felt as if it dragged on as this thing stared in. It felt like hours before finally it turned its head toward the woods and walked away. As it turned, Cole saw that it had a muzzle like that of a dog. He told Livewire about it in the morning, but Livewire, thinking he was joking, laughed everything off. Cole stayed for the remainder of the week but he never ventured into those woods again. A Visit at the Barn From Akirate I grew up in a foster home, and I was raised at a farm with a lot of horses, 
sheep, dogs, and cats. My foster parents are really strict, and my daily chores were to feed all the animals at specific times during the day. The farm is located in the middle of nowhere, and during winter, it's pitch blackout. The only way to not stumble is to have a headlamp and let the dogs guide you. The farm is over 100 years old, and all over the place there are old tools. I always had an eerie feeling at night here, like something was watching me. But I always trusted that the animals would tell me if something was wrong. One night, of course during winter, I put on my lamp and took the dogs with me, having the oldest dog guide me down the hill. Right in front of me, I could kind of see the two pastures that are used for the sheep sometimes, but they were empty that night. They're not very big, and there are no trees, only a shelter that is approximately three meters high. I had this eerie feeling again, and just a few seconds later, I saw the dog stop, staring out into the darkness. She was tense in her whole body, and I asked her out loud what was wrong. I then looked in the same direction she was, and I saw it. My headlamp lit the pasture, and in it stood this black shadow. As I said before, there are no trees, nothing near the pasture to give a shadow like that. It looked like it was either facing me or the other way. Since I couldn't see the details, I couldn't be sure. But I could see what looked to be arms, and I could tell it was tall, as tall as the roof on the shelter. It didn't do anything. It just stood there, almost as frozen as I was. I couldn't see its face. It was just a black silhouette, really, with legs, long legs. The next second, the dog started to run and bark like crazy. She just left me there, rounding the barn to the entrance of the pasture. I was terrified. I quickly ran after her, calling her name, but she didn't answer, but she usually does. I heard her continue barking when I ran, and when I got to the entrance, she fell silent, but still faced the exact spot where I'd seen that shadow. The pasture was empty, and she kind of looked surprised. It was the, what was I barking at, kind of expression on her. We continued the night and I felt nothing more, and I haven't seen anything like it since. But I know something was there that night, since our dog saw something too. She was raised on that farm for 14 years and didn't bark nor run away if she didn't feel the need to defend us. The Word We Don't Say From Mickey G a few months ago, I was working at an assisted living facility, part-time, overnight. I'd worked at many assisted living facilities and had many odd experiences over the years. One night, I was sitting in the sunroom and heard an odd noise. Once I tracked the noise into someone's room, I found that static was playing from the radio, which was turned off. This was on my second set of rounds, so I'm sure that the radio was off. I heard the same noise coming from a room down the hall, the same situation. Static from the radio. Neither of these residents were very mobile and wouldn't have been able to cross their rooms to turn those radios on. These two residents were the next two to steeply decline and pass away in the facility. We also had many stories of weird, creepy, or just frightening things that have happened at my current place of work, which is now a summer camp slash retreat center. Our campus is pretty secluded, when I was hired and given a tour of all the facilities, we toured the building called the Farmhouse. The Farmhouse is just as it sounds, an original building from the farm that was on the land before the camp was established. My tour guide said to me, And this building is the haunted one. And she was right. One of the housekeepers was cleaning the farmhouse when they heard older male voices coming from the basement. The building was supposed to be vacant, and the construction happening on it was on hold too, so there should have been no one down there. 
For context, this is the most disturbing basement I've ever been in. Old, dingy, cramped, and straight out of an amateur horror film. The housekeeper also reported hearing the sound of construction coming from the basement as well. She called downstairs when she did, but the lights were off and no one replied. Creepier yet, there were no cars out front, no staff in the building with her at all. Other encounters in the farmhouse included hearing voices or footsteps when no one was there, doors opening and closing on their own, lights being left on when no one had been in there, and seeing things out of the corners of your eyes. A shaman group came and stayed in the building often. They're one of my favorite groups that come to camp. They've told me first-hand experiences such as guests sleeping in the farmhouse, waking to ghostly faces staring them in the eye. They also insist that there's bad energy in a few of our cabins. In one of our newest buildings on numerous occasions, people have reported hearing noises that were not normal for that building, specifically from the loft apartment. People were usually too scared to investigate. These noises would be like normal lying noises, a bed creaking, light steps, something hitting the floor, etc. Two of my coworkers were working in the kitchen one day in this building. It was early in the morning when they heard a scream that they described as a banshee cry. At the time, we had a retreat group of shamans that were learning how to get in touch with their ancestors at the camp. We also had a retreat group that had a very old member of their family who was transitioning to the last stage of their life. They swear they heard no one around and didn't see anyone, but the scream came from the dining room connected to the kitchen via a sliding barn door. Items also seem to fall without cause in the kitchen often, even when carefully stacked. Many people spread their ashes on this property or come to cleanse themselves and shake off anything negative. There's so much hurt, pain, and trauma shared and let go at camp, so it's no surprise the atmosphere would reflect that in some way. People have also reported hearing noises from a formerly certified kitchen, such as clanging and banging. This was in the retreat center, added on to the old dairy barn. The kitchen is connected to the retreat center via a large dining room. Past that dining room is a large gathering space where our summer camp counselors sleep during the week. The counselors were the only ones to hear the noises. The aforementioned cabins are very basic. No air conditioning, old bunk beds, something you'd expect from a summer camp in a scary movie. One story I'd heard from a very down-to-earth summer staff really got to me. They were coming up a hill to the farmhouse when they heard a scream from behind them. Mind you, it didn't sound like a child screaming. It sounded masculine. The staff member went to the summer staff lounge and asked for an escort from another staff member due to being so frightened. Another similar story to the cabin and farmhouse screamer happened this summer. Three staff were up late at night and heard what they described as coyotes fighting each other or a dog. They insisted a pack was tearing this animal apart due to the screams and howls they heard. When it sounded like the fight was over, they went looking for the hurt animal. They could hear it crying in pain and they thought it was dying. I don't know why they went looking, but those are the choices staff members make during the summer. They swore the noise was coming from right behind them in the trees. But when they made it to the spot where they thought the fight took place, there was nothing but silence, nothing indicating that a fight ever happened. No crying, no whining, no blood. They didn't hear the supposed coyotes or dog again. I've never heard of or seen coyotes so close to camp. They thought it was most likely 10 to 15 feet into the woods. I've also never heard coyotes coming from that part of camp and haven't heard them since. Some staff sleeping in the cabins have reported sporadic cases of farm animal noises coming from behind the cabins, close to where the coyotes were heard this summer. The cabins are a small walk from the old dairy farm. Down the hill from the farmhouse and the old retreat center with the haunted kitchen is a campfire pit with benches surrounding it. One night a week, we have s'mores for a snack before campfire. We send the kids to the edge of the woods to find roasting sticks. On one occasion a few weeks ago, a counselor and I were standing back from the group, just talking. Campfire is often a time for counselors to seek support or guidance. 
while the campers are distracted searching for sticks. The s'mores were long gone by then, and everyone was seated around the fire doing skits and telling stories. As the counselor and I were talking, we heard a noise from the woods, rustling and branches cracking. It sounded kind of like a small child. If you've heard a small person moving through the woods, that was kind of the noise. It was within 10 feet of us. The counselor rushed in, calling softly for the kid, trying to coax them out of the woods. But they found no child, nor any evidence of anyone walking through the forest. I went to ask leadership to make sure we had all the campers and staff accounted for, and we did. While I was doing that, I found the counselor about 15 feet back from where we were standing. In my absence, they'd heard the noise move further to a retreat building. They called out again, no answer. Needless to say, we don't stand in that spot anymore. Moving to the other side of camp, our campground is where I hear the most reports of screams and strange figures. By all reports, the campground was just a field when the camp bought the property. One experience I had a couple of years ago has kept me from going out to the campground at night, unless absolutely necessary. We have a few utility vehicles, and sometimes when a counselor or staff member needs a time out, they will take a ride in these vehicles. It was right after dark when three of us took a ride out to the campground to clear our heads. We parked to talk for a minute. While we were parked, we heard masculine adult voices coming from a separate part of the campground. We felt obligated then to make sure no one was in that area, as much as we dreaded it. There were definitely some non-camp counselor approved words said about that decision. We drove out, parked, but nothing. The noises stopped, no speaking, no rustling, and no one in sight. We rushed out of there, and I haven't put myself in that situation again. There have been many reports of screams heard across camp that originated from the campground. Never feminine, always masculine. This has been going on for years, and the reports are always similar, even from new staff that have never heard the stories and legends yet. Some of our campers were staying in one of the newest retreat buildings, not the haunted kitchen one, and they saw a dark masculine figure coming from the direction of the campground. It seems the more we talk about the spirits hanging about, the more they make themselves known to us. During dinner prep one night, the same co-workers that heard that banshee sound and my husband and I were talking about the scary stories surrounding camp. That night, my husband and I were taking an after-dark walk, and we stopped after seeing a light coming from behind the haunted kitchen building that shouldn't be there. We watched it for a minute before deciding what to do, and as we figured we'd walk the other way, we heard what sounded like little girls laughing on the deck. We still ended up going on the deck after that, but we didn't find the source of that light. I actually debated telling this last story from camp, but I think it's a fitting ending to these creepy tales. First, I'm not going to type out the word, but it is 10 letters starting with S and ending with R. This specific creature comes from Navajo culture. I firmly believe that when you speak this name, you give them power, and I'm not up for that. This word came into conversation once in the kitchen at camp. If you've ever worked in a kitchen, you know that every and all conversations are fair game. We talked a bit about them and moved on. A few days after that conversation, my husband and I randomly ran into a family friend waiting for a table at a local restaurant. She was talking about a dead animal she'd found in her yard, which had been somewhat mutilated. Her daughter thought what had killed it was the word and spoke it out loud. By now, I'm not wanting to hear that word around me at all. Hearing or talking about them twice within a week was more than enough for me. At that point, the word had been declared a forbidden word in the kitchen and at camp. A week or so later, I was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and I was listening to this podcast when a story mentioning the word came on. I foolishly listened to it. At home that night, when my husband and I were winding down to bed, our dog gave two short barks out the window facing the backyard. This isn't unusual and we thought of ignoring it, but something told me to look out. 
I did, and at the end of our driveway, I swear, was this black blob. There was nothing out there to cast a shadow, as it was far too dark, and the blob took no real shape. We were terrified. I went downstairs to open that door and get a better look. I looked at that dark blob for half a minute, and as I turned to go back inside, I saw the blob begin to morph into the head and front legs of a coyote or dog. I slammed and locked the door, rushing to my husband. He admitted that he saw it start to shift, but not the actual morphing. Now, the next story is the origin of our ghost at home, who I believe followed me to work and continues to come with me wherever I go. When I was in my late teens, a friend and I were out driving around smoking. We were in rural Wisconsin, so there were plenty of back roads to cruise. Once we got 20 to 30 miles away from our starting point, we stopped at this old and frequently used but not so abandoned graveyard. I know, lots of spooky things happen at graveyards, but this wasn't your typical dumb teenager doing rituals in the cemetery story. It's more like your typical dumb teenagers in a graveyard looking for trouble story. My friend and I looked around. We found the oldest headstones, then read off some names. We found some familiar last names. We then found a small maintenance shack, and to our surprise, it held old worn headstones, and less surprisingly, hedge clippers and other tools. Now this wasn't the first graveyard I'd visited in the middle of the night but I'd never found old headstones just lying around. We read them and looked for why they were in the shack, but they weren't in disrepair, just worn from Wisconsin weather over the years. Now I'll remind you that, clearly, I was not in the best state of mind having been smoking. I hoisted one of the small headstones into my arms. The name was something old-timey and feminine that started with an R, I believe. We then went off back to our homes, Soon after that, I became super paranoid about having this headstone, and I started to burn McCormick's sage from a shaker bottle in my tiny studio apartment. The atmosphere in the apartment didn't feel right anymore, and I felt so uncomfortable there, like someone was there with me. As a disclaimer, this was in the midst of my battle with addiction, but I do truly think these events happened, and they weren't just a product of my using. Fast forward a few nights, I was at a friend's house, not too far from my own. I drove there and hung out for a bit. Eventually, it was time for me to go. I walked out the back door to my car and went to get in. There seemed to be something there, like a shadow, but not at the right angle to be natural. I was terrified and opted to walk home in the dark in an interesting state of mind. The whole time I was practically running, I was so freaked out, and I never run. I felt as if something was following me. The next day, I went to work at a local fast food establishment. It was a slow time between rushes. We were all chatting. All of a sudden, I kid you not, the name from the headstone I took popped up on one of our to-go tickets. Now, I had not told anyone about that headstone yet, and my friend that was with me at the time of the event didn't live in the area and would not have been talking to the people I worked with. After our shift was done, I recruited a co-worker and my now husband to go to the graveyard and respectfully return the headstone ASAP. I can't say things were better after that, but definitely different. As creepy things continued to happen in my apartment, my husband and I began to call the ghost Phyllis. My husband and I began blaming every creepy, unexplainable thing that happened to us on Phyllis, which happened to be a lot of things. And now it seems Phyllis has been with us through every move. Warning. The following story contains depictions of harm against animals. A Bigfoot attacked my truck. From Danny Joe. This story was told to me by my grandfather, who was a semi-driver for 20 years, and my dad validated it. I'm going to tell it like he told it to me. From his point of view. It was 1987, early fall on a Montana highway. I was transporting live pigs from one farm to another. Late into the night, around 11 p.m., I decided to stop and get some shut-eye, so I found a small runoff on the road. 
After walking around my semi and trailer to make sure everything was locked down and secure, I got back up in the cab and finally went to sleep. Around 3 a.m., I was awakened by the harsh squealing of the pigs. I jumped up, startled, and hopped out of the truck to check on what was going on. When I got around to the back of the trailer, I saw some blood on the ground and a bit of flesh. I was very uneasy because I didn't understand what was happening. At that moment, I heard something behind me. It sounded like an incredibly low-toned growl. This made my skin crawl, so I began to make my way back to the front. As I got to the front, I got back in the truck and decided to go ahead and leave. There was no way I was going to be able to go back to sleep after that. I drove for about two more hours before coming to a truck stop. The sun was finally making its way up, so I would finally be able to get a good look at what happened with the trailer to see what was going on. Looking at the trailer then, I noticed one of the pigs was dead from what looked to be a huge cut, causing way too much blood loss. Instantly, I was concerned about what was trying to get into the trailer. Another driver came over, asking what happened. I replied, I've got no idea. What do you make of it? The guy looked over the whole thing, then got really close to the trailer and started to grab something. What are you doing? I asked. He looked up and showed me what he found. Well, what do you make of this? He said, lifting his hand, holding a large, dark form. It looked like a black claw. Goosebumps popped up over my whole body, and I didn't know what to say or think at the moment. He gave me the claw and told me to stay on the road. Apparently, he had heard stories of truckers going missing on the same stretch of road I'd come from. I went ahead and filled up on fuel, then made my way to the drop-off. As I got to my destination, which was a small farm, I backed up the load to the barn doors and went to talk to the farmer. He greeted me outside the barn doors with a confused look. He spoke up and asked, What happened? You were supposed to be here an hour ago. I was hesitant to tell him why, but I went ahead. You see, something happened on the road when I stopped for some rest the back end of the trailer. I paused for a moment, and he spoke up. Well, what is it? Well, something tried to get into the trailer, and it killed one of the pigs. The farmer looked very confused, asking what road it was. I told him, Country Road 31 East for about 85 miles. All of a sudden, he had this look of fear come over him. I got a little curious and asked what the problem was. He finally spoke again, wondering if I heard or saw anything else. I replied with, Well, now that you mention it, I did hear this growl. Sounded big, like from a bear or something. He did not seem okay with that answer. Well, friend, we haven't had bears in the area you drove for over 60 years. Now I was confused. He went on. There's a story, a legend really that over a 200-mile radius, there are one or two Sasquatch, and they use the area for hunting grounds. I chuckled a bit, but he looked at me like I was an idiot. He recommended I take my next load over the main highway to avoid another run-in. Thankfully, my next load was goats from his farm to another about 400 miles the other direction. The farmer loaded up the goats, and I was on my way again, thinking about the old farmer's story and his warning to stay away from that country road. I scoffed and thought to myself he was just joking with me. I went ahead and stopped at the truck stop before the country road and had a late lunch. Might as well have been dinner. By the time I was done eating, it was getting dark. Not really thinking about it, I got back in the semi and started my way to my next stop. As I passed the sign saying I was starting on the country road, a feeling of dread came over me, but I kept on going. About 75 miles down the country road, my truck blew a tire. I had to pull to the side of the road to check out how bad it was. As an owner-operator, I was able to do most things needed when it came to my rig. I saw that the tire wasn't actually blown, it just had a nail in it. 
this was much better than a blowout. I went back to the cab and I started to look for my plug kit so I could fix the tire to get me back on the road. It was getting dark quick and colder and my plugs were too cold to use so I had to put them on the dash to warm them up first before using them. As I waited, I heard the goats bleeding and making some noise, so I reached under my seat for my pistol from when I was in the army. Nothing special, just a 45 caliber 1911 standard issue for servicemen. I got out of the truck and made my way to the rear, only to see the rear entrance had now been opened. In fact, one of the goats was halfway out, its throat torn out. I went into panic mode then, starting to look around, because it looked to me like I interrupted something trying to pull out that goat. At that moment, I heard the same growl again, but it was closer. It was so dark, I grabbed my flashlight, pointing it towards the sound. All I could see was a silhouette and yellow eyes. These eyes were almost seven and a half feet off the ground, though. I started to back up, and as I did, that silhouette stepped forward a bit, more into the light. And I tell you, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I never would have believed it. There it was, standing on two legs, what I could only call a Bigfoot, with blood dripping out of its mouth. I pulled my gun, pointing it at the creature. But then it stopped, like it knew what I was holding. It began to growl and snarl louder at me. I wanted to shoot, but I was horrified. Even with my gun drawn, I was walking backward. Then I had another thought. If I could make it to the cab of the semi-truck, I had a Polaroid camera, and I could take a picture. So I lowered my gun and walked even faster backwards. As I made it to the door, I heard the goats going crazy again. I opened the door, reaching for the camera. Then I started to make my way back to the rear of the trailer. I stopped right before I got to the door, hearing the growling again in front of me. I pointed my flashlight with one hand, the camera with the other, and I snapped a photo. In an instant, I turned around and ran back to the cab of the truck, got in, and just drove away. I laid the photo down on the other seat and drove. I didn't care about the tire anymore or the goats in the back. I was in flight mode, wanting to get to a safe place. I drove for over two hours straight before seeing lights from a gas station. I pulled in and slammed on the brakes. As I jumped out, the gas station attendant came out to me, asking what the rush was about. My face said it all, pure terror. He brought me inside and told me he'd have one of his mechanics fix the tire, which was now mostly torn up and on the rim. As I sat down inside, I noticed I'd grabbed the photo off the seat. I looked at it. At first, my eyes were dry and I didn't see anything. The attendant walked up behind me and said, Creepy, where'd you take that at? I looked at him in confusion, then wiped my face down with a wet washcloth. I looked again. I saw what he saw. Two big yellow glowing eyes. Almost looked like they were floating there in the dark. I called my next stop and told them my truck had broke down and I wasn't able to make their delivery on time. He was a bit mad, but sent another driver to pick up the load. After I got off the phone with him, I walked on over to the shop. At that point, I just wanted to get home to my family. I'd been driving for a while. Once there, the mechanic told me he put on a new tire, reminding me to take it easy next time. But when I looked at him, he just stopped talking and gave me the keys, apologizing. After about 18 hours behind the wheel, I finally made it home. I was greeted by my son and wife. I couldn't have felt happier to be farther away from that place. My son has always got in the truck to get my stuff and grab the photo too. He looked at it and was immediately creeped out. He asked where I took the picture, but I told him I'd tell him later. That's it for my grandpa's story. My dad told me that my grandpa would tell him the whole story when he was on his deathbed. Only because he figured if he was dying, then whatever he encountered should be dead by then too. I've never thought things like werewolves or Bigfoot were real. But my dad has never lied to me. He even showed me the picture. That photo was over 30 years old, 
and I could still make out the yellow eyes in it. It sent chills up my spine. I now know something like that is out there, and I never want to encounter it. Warning. The following story contains depictions of harm against animals. Appalachian creatures stalk my family. From Aggie. I'll start by stating the general area of where this all took place, and actually continues to take place. I, as well as generations of my family, were born and raised in West Virginia, right in the Appalachian Belt. My grandmother has about seven acres on a mountain, where we all ran wild as kids. Now, as adults, we sit at night around a bonfire, enjoying the peaceful sounds. However, there comes a point in the night where the air grows heavy and sinister. Around these times, my grandmother's two large dogs even refused to go off the porch to do their business. We don't know what lurks in the surrounding woods, but sometimes it makes itself known. When my three aunts, mother, and three uncles were younger, they did what all of us did as kids, roamed those woods. My grandmother's property has what we call a spring house, which is exactly how it sounds. It's a concrete block structure that has a peaceful and fresh spring that runs right through it. It was used before running water was put into the old farmhouse that sits atop the mountain, overlooking the entire property. At that point, the spring house had been worn down and the woods began to overtake it, surrounding it so that it was buried deep. The weird thing about this spring house was that the only opening sat atop of it, so in order to even get into it, you would have to drop down from the top. As kids, you aren't really afraid of much except at night. It was apparently broad daylight when one of my aunts, we'll call her in, got the idea to do just that, drop in. When she dropped inside, all seemed fine. It was pitch dark, but she could feel and hear the water around her. She then began to hear soft breathing. She turned to one of the corners of the spring house. There, she saw an all-white humanoid creature staring at her. They were both stunned to see one another. This thing had sickly white skin, elongated limbs, and dark holes for facial features. All at once, fear pushed to the forefront, and she began to scream at my other aunt, B, to pull her back up. During the commotion, her glasses slid off her face and hid into the water below. She could feel the thing moving around now, and she screamed more. One of my uncles, Kay, yanked her out of the hole, where she began running towards the house. Her fear spurred the entire group, and they all followed after her. Eventually, she calmed down enough to tell them what she saw, and they never went back to the spring house again. I'm not sure if she told my grandmother, as my grandmother is quite religious, and even to this day, she brushes off any paranormal experience we have at her place. Now, the story doesn't end there. In fact, it's just getting started. Years later, when my aunts and uncles were all grown up with children of their own, the spring house lured some of my cousins and sisters to it. They had heard of the white creature down there, but of course, they didn't believe my aunts. Kids being kids, they went through the woods until the spring house came into view. They planned to drop into it too. My cousin dropped down first. My sister lingered over the hole and stared down at her not dropping in just yet. It took all of a few seconds before my cousin heard heavy breathing. Her fear immediately spiked, but she didn't say anything. Instead, she turned toward the sound. My aunt's long, eroded glasses sat in the water beside the same all-white, elongated creature. This time, it did not hesitate. It began to stretch out its limbs to move. She scrambled up, and out with the help of my sister, and they too booked it back to the house. They told my aunt and mother what happened. They didn't deny the creature's existence, but instead consoled them as best they could, warning them to stay away from the place. 
When I eventually came into this world, I was always roaming my grandmother's property too. I rarely liked going to school, and instead I wanted to roam the woods and collect anything and everything I could find. I was often alone out there. Only my grandma's farm dog followed me about. However, the first time I saw the creature, it was during a family get-together. The adults were drinking by a bonfire when a few of my cousins and I decided to play a game called Cops and Robbers. Our version of it was basically hide and seek, but instead of one seeker, there was a group of them. And there was a group of hiders too. I was a hider this time around. I got the bright idea to hide behind an old Lincoln car parked by the barn, since I knew everyone else would be too scared to go out that far. After all, the light barely reached that far only enough to see shadows. The car was also on the property line with my grandmother's neighbors, where a mobile home sat, unoccupied. The neighbor's house was a few feet away and was dark, as it was late. I sat down behind the car, closest to the trailer. A few minutes went by and I could faintly hear my cousins giggling and screaming gleefully. I shuffled to a squatting position, smiling to myself. Suddenly, I heard a whistle from behind me. I stiffened right away. My body seemed to know something wasn't right before my mind did. The whistle came softly again. It was almost too quiet to hear. A sound used to get someone's attention. I heard it all the time when my great uncle would use it to call his dog. This time though, it sounded slightly distorted. I gathered my courage, and I fully stood and began to turn towards the sound. Beside a tall tree near the trailer was this all-white creature. It was also squatting like I had been, but upon seeing me staring in fear, it straightened. The thing was nearly seven feet tall, a sickly pale white color that shone even in the dark. Its limbs were long and grotesque, and before I knew it, I was running as fast as my legs could take me. I ended up colliding into one of my cousins, who I was very close with at the time, named Jay. She and I then slammed into the dirt. She yelped and was ready to rip me a new one, but she must have quickly seen the fear in my face, because instead, she asked what was wrong. I ended up telling her and we agreed to quit the game entirely, and went into the house for the rest of the night. A few months later, though, the incident was nearly forgotten by us. Once again, the adults were partying, and we were playing the same game. I stayed well away from the barn at this point, and only hid near the house, staying in the light as much as possible. My cousin, Jane, didn't. She had a spurt of bravery or something. She went farther out than I'd previously gone, going directly behind the old barn. Behind the barn was nothing but woods for literal miles, and no light reaching that far. The moon was particularly bright, a full moon that summer night. She told me that's why she could slightly see out there. After a few moments, she grew bored and began to jog around the barn instead of just retracing her steps. That's when, out of the corner of her eye, she saw a man in a bright red sweater just sitting on an all-white lawn chair, staring into the woods. Now, we knew who all was there. This man did not look like any relative of ours, nor the nearby neighbors. The creepy thing was, he didn't even jump or move when she came by. She said it was like he was frozen. His skin was sickly white, like the creature's. It almost glowed. Obviously, she was afraid and ran back to the house calling my name. We met up, and she told me what happened. We never really said much to the grown-ups when they were drinking, as they seemed to have a habit of always laughing at whatever we told them, so we took it upon ourselves to investigate. Together, the two of us crept over towards the barn. We peeked around the corner to see the lawn chair empty. No one was around. As we turned to walk back, I heard my name whispered inside the dilapidated barn. Jay heard it too, 
Her eyes widened as she looked at my face. We both ran, tears in our eyes. That night, we slept with my poor grandma, smashed up against one another. The sound of that whisper still scares me to this very day. Just thinking about it sends shivers up my spine. Although the next night, we slept in the upstairs spare bedroom, as they call it, and to our horror, my grandma's dog kept looking into our deceased great-grandmother's room, growling softly. We shut the door with him inside the room with us until morning, as we didn't dare to step in front of her room to get to the stairs. The following day, after telling my Aunt B, she admitted the upstairs portion of the house always creeped her out. When I inquired why, she told me when she was a little girl, she'd watched a cheesy, scary movie about werewolves. But in her young mind, it was very creepy. Afterwards, her and my grandmother slept in the third bedroom at the end of the hall. She was having trouble sleeping that night due to the movie replaying in her mind. She dozed off and on, but at one point, she began to hear heavy breathing. The room was suddenly hot and moist as well. Her eyes shot open, and she saw a werewolf-like creature sitting at the bottom of her bed, eyes right on her. It stayed like this until morning. Now, obviously, this isn't the same creature we'd all been seeing, but I know skinwalkers can mimic voices and other things, which can scare you. And that night it had been werewolves for her, so maybe this entity or another was similar and wants to mimic your fears. Anyway, after she told me this, I stopped going upstairs for a long time. Whenever I stayed with my grandmother during the summer, I slept downstairs in the living room on her couch. I was always frightened there at night. I constantly left the TV playing to drown out any noises, as my grandma liked to sleep with her doors and windows wide open. On a few occasions, I was awakened by the shadow of a person stepping in front of the TV to stare. Then it would proceed into the kitchen. This always horrified me, but I would convince myself I was dreaming. However, it always happened at 3 a.m. on the dot multiple nights a week. Sometimes I swear the kitchen light would switch on and the faucet in there would turn on, water exploding loudly onto the ceramic. My grandma, who had her bed in the living room as well, due to having arthritic knees and not being able to climb the stairs nightly, never heard any of this. However, her dog, who often slept on my legs, would sit up, ears perked towards the kitchen, now, this was happening after my great-grandmother had passed, and she was an odd creature herself. When she was alive at 3 a.m. every night, she would go into the kitchen, turn the lights on, and just sit there for hours playing cards on the wooden dining room table. When I asked her why a few times, she always told me, I can talk to my husband. Her husband had died a long time ago, but as a young kid... I thought this was all very weird. My great-grandmother and I never got along, so if it was her doing this at night, I still didn't feel too safe. I even had a dream about her after the kitchen light flicked on and I dozed off because I was used to it by this point. In the dream, the stairway light was on and she began to descend the steps. I was shocked to see her because even in the dream, I knew she died. I walked over to the steps. The rest of the house was dark besides the one light. She looked like her usual self in her normal all-white attire. However, when I looked up at her and smiled, she frowned deeply. I sensed something was wrong then, like it wasn't her. She spoke in a deep, harsh tone and like her usual voice. Hello. I was scared now, every hair on my body standing up. I tried to wake myself up, knowing it was a dream. What are you doing here? I stammered, stepping back. Whatever the thing was that mimicked her smiled cruelly. I came to tell you something important. You're all going to hell. This is hell. 
All the demons are here. After the words were out, I was suddenly awake, gasping for air. I kept replaying her or its words all night, unable to sleep. My mind decided all meant my family and I, and I was distraught for days, wanting to go home to get away from that house. So I did. I didn't frequent it much in my teenage years either. I got a job at 15 to help out with the bills, and eventually I moved to a city about 20 minutes away when I turned 18. I don't visit there often, as my family and I are not on the best terms anymore. But one of my aunts has moved in recently to help out my grandmother as she ages. She's told me about how the dogs don't go out at night anymore, how sometimes she hears an odd screech and all the crickets go silent, how one night she heard something scream her name from the woods. She even told me about how the neighbor, who's lived there nearly as long as our family has, called my grandma to tell her he heard such an odd scream from the woods too. He immediately got back on his tractor and drove it into the garage, locking the doors tight. This has never happened before, and to hear how frightened a man who has lived there his entire life was, I was a bit shaken up. When I did find time to sneak up there without a ton of family members being there, my aunt and I found a baby raccoon who had been killed in an odd way. Usually, coyotes kill and eat them, and there aren't any other predators in the area. But the thing about this was, it was whole. It looked like whoever killed it had twisted it, forcing its legs to face the wrong way. There were no other indicators of how it died. All of its legs were seemingly unbroken, even. A few days after this, my aunt called to tell me she found multiple twisted animals, all like that, all placed along the tree line. To this day, my family and I exchange these scary stories. We rarely, if ever, go near those woods at night. If I decide to take my dogs on a small hike, I stay fairly close to the tree line when we're in the woods, even during the day. We have so many stories about the odd happenings there, like mysterious lights hovering near us, screams from the woods, odd lights in the sky, a lot of weird things. The house and land are so beautiful, but something old and haunting lurks around it, stalking generations of my family, and I'm not sure if it will ever leave us alone. Something in the Hayfield From the Washington Farmer I don't usually think much of the supernatural, but this experience really changed my perspective. I'm 22, but I was 21 at the time this happened. I spent the summer of 2022 working in southwestern Oregon. I had taken a summer job off from Wildland Fire for a good paying job baling hay for a custom hay company. It was mid August, and they had me in a new Holland T7 260 with two other tractors in the field that night. We did most of our meadow hay baling at night as you have to be careful about the moisture of grass hay when baling, or else it can spontaneously combust when stacked. I was working on the west end of the field, while the other two tractors were on the east end, making their way towards me. It must have been around midnight or 1am. I was going along, jamming out to some Credence Clearwater Revival, when my baler got plugged. The hay had bunched up in front of the feeder drum, I was probably going too fast for the conditions where I ran across a wet spot. The field was flood irrigated, so it wasn't too uncommon to find some hay that hadn't dried completely. I climbed out of my tractor to deal with the plug, pulling out handfuls of hay until the baler would take the pile. The tractor had a bunch of auxiliary lights, so the area around it was quite well lit. To be honest with you, I never did like the dark but I felt pretty safe at the time. I was probably two windrows from the edge of the field at that moment. The fence lines around the field had tall canary grass growing at least six feet tall where these swathers couldn't get to. This had always bothered me for some reason, but I'm from eastern Washington, 
so I'm used to being able to see for a ways out. As I lay in the hay trying to unplug my baler, I heard the grass at the edge of the field moving. I looked over towards the sound, but I didn't see anything just yet. I figured it was an animal or something, and I didn't think much more of it. After I got the baler unplugged, I hopped back into the tractor and kept going. It wasn't too long after that that I happened to see a coyote at the edge of where my lights were shining. Again, didn't think much of it. Fast forward about 20 minutes, I see a coyote again, still hanging out just outside the range of the work lights of my tractor. I started to think about it, how bold it was, getting this close to my tractor. Around 3 a.m., I had a shear bolt break on the baler. It's a simple fix, it's just a bolt that goes through the flywheel of the baler that's designed to break if there's too much strain on it. Kind of a safety feature to make sure you don't damage the baler itself. I went out to change out the bolt, when I heard something. It sounded like a voice, but I couldn't quite make it out. I tried to hurry up with the shear bolt replacement. As I finished up and I was closing the shield on the baler, I heard the voice again. It kind of sounded like one of my friends who was driving one of the tractors on the other side of the field. I looked around, but both sets of headlights were still moving. I was starting to freak out at this point. There shouldn't be anyone out here at 3 a.m. We're five miles down a gravel road from a town of like 40 people. I started to rush towards the tractor and climb the steps. The voice was getting louder, calling my name. I climbed in and slammed the door shut behind me. As I'm putting the tractor in gear, I looked out the door. At the edge of where my lights were shining was what looked to be a coyote. This time, however, there's something wrong with it. It looked all mangy and the eyes weren't shining the right color. They almost looked crimson red. On its face was what resembled a smile. Then I swear I saw it stand up on its hind legs. It tried to take a clumsy step in my direction. Ooh, when I saw this, I dumped the clutch and kept on moving. Up until the sun came up, every time I looked in the mirror, I could see a coyote staying just beyond the lights of my tractor, just like it had before. As the sun was coming up over the mountain next to us, I saw that coyote begin to run towards the tall grass at the end of the field. I radioed the other guys and the other tractors, but they had no clue what I was talking about. Thank God I didn't have a plug up or another sheer bolt break after that. I have no idea what I saw or what I heard that night, but that wasn't the last of it. Several nights later, We'd gotten rained out, so I was able to sleep at night instead of during the day. It was in the bunkhouse. I was on the second floor on my bunk bed. I just woke up around 4 a.m. and I could not go back to sleep. But when I'm up, I'm up. So I just lay in my bed, scrolling through TikTok. It was around then that I began to hear scratching on the window. Like I said, this is the second floor. Now, there are no trees near the building. It was then that I heard that same dang voice trying to mimic one of my coworkers who wasn't even in town that night. After about 20 minutes, everything went silent again. That was the last I ever heard of whatever that was, and I hope I never have to deal with it again. I've no clue what it was, but I have heard stories of things like skinwalkers, and I wonder if it could have been that. The Dog Man from MJ2004 This encounter happened to me four years ago when I was 16. I live in a small farm village with about four houses on the main property and four more on the other side of the road. I remember there being four kids in the farm, and we would always hang out. 
It was a normal day when it happened, like all the other days. I recall my friend Kay and I hanging out at the big tree we usually went to. It was getting dark and I told her that I needed to go home. However, she being younger and tougher than me, suggested we go into the woods behind my house. My parents always told me that if I wanted to go into the woods, I should have an adult with me. But being who I was, I ignored my parents' advice, agreeing to Kay's idea. Our original plan was to go in, see if we could find anything cool or interesting, take a picture, and leave. So Kay and I walked our way over to the woods. Kay made a few jokes on our way, and as soon as we arrived at the tree line, I remember her saying, Something feels wrong. At the time, I didn't notice, but while we walked to the woods, the birds and animals stopped making noise. It was odd, since the birds around here always chirped, with the occasional yell of a jackal. But at that moment, it was dead silent. I felt Kay's hand tremble in mine as she spoke. On second thought, let's go home. She started to walk away, but I got confused and annoyed at the same time. I remember grabbing her hand and pulling her with me, saying, We came all the way here. I'm not leaving until we find something cool. Little did I know I would regret those words later. We walked into the woods, and I turned my phone's light on since the shadows of the trees were blocking out the remaining sunlight. I remember feeling very uneasy, and I heard Kay say, Come on, girl, let's go home. Something isn't right. Before she could finish, we were cut off by a low growl. Both Kay and I instantly whipped our heads around to where the sound came from. We saw just a male impala looking at us as if to ask, did you make that sound? Then it turned and ran off. I gulped, thinking maybe it was a wild dog, or that hyena my dad saw a few weeks back. Kay said, let's just go. Then she gasped. I turned to see her eyes wide, her face pale. She was staring at something now behind me. My heart began to pound fast. I turned around too, slowly and what I saw next made me regret ever agreeing to go there. It looked like a buff bodybuilder, although it wasn't. The thing that caught my eye was how its legs were shaped, like a dog's hind legs with sharp claws on its fingers. The thing's face was terrifying. Its jaw was shaped like a wolf's, and its fur was a dusty brown color. I found myself looking into its eyes, those eyes. I'll never forget them. They were a bright, bright yellow color, almost glowing and strangely human-like. I felt its eyes stare deep into my soul. I was in a trance. I soon whipped my head toward where Kay was, or was supposed to be. She ran off without me. My heart stopped for a second as I heard this beast take a step forward. As I turned, it was right in front of me. Tears streamed down my face as the beast let out a silent snarl, lifting its large arm. I wanted to cry out for help, yell out to Kay, but my voice was caught in my throat. The beast growled, and I felt its long fingers in my hair. It wore a silent snarl on its face as its thumb dug into my forehead, its nail cutting into my skin. Blood ran down my face, and I thought to myself, I'm going to die today. Strangely, the beast let go of my head, turning around and walking into the tree line. It turned, looking at me as if it was smiling to scare me even more. It turned back around, leaning down on all fours like a dog, and left. As soon as it was out of my sight, my legs started to run on their own, and I found myself at Kay's house, crying and yelling at her to let me in. Kay's brother let me in, and I instantly fell into his arms, crying even more. After the whole incident, Kay and I never told anyone what happened or what we saw. But since then, I've never looked at those woods the same way again. 
I did some research on what I saw that day and came across people who had the same experiences as me. Some people describe the beasts as dogmen, lichens, or even werewolves. To this day, I shiver at the thought of it. Be careful out there. You never know what might be lurking in the woods. Predator Control Officer From Mato Man I live in a rural area, in an otherwise densely populated county in Utah. My career has been nightmarish thus far, even though I've chosen safe career paths. I decided to leave finance to pursue security, then decided to pursue a low-key job with the county as a predator control officer. I know what you're probably thinking, but it's not predators like offenders of a certain type, if you catch my drift. But what it means is predators like coyotes. There is a coyote bounty in Utah due to overpopulation and the subsequent effect on the rural community, but this also includes mountain lions too, which occasionally make their way into neighborhoods. There's also bears, who mostly just like to eat garbage. The application was easy. I applied and they asked if I was experienced in hunting and the wilderness. They asked if I was clerically qualified as I would also be in charge of paying for coyote bounties and keeping track of all those records, on top of the hands-on work I would be responsible for. They said that the last employee left suddenly and did not go into any more detail. For a job that paid as little as this, I wasn't surprised and I didn't ask questions. Though the pay was low, the job was enjoyable. I spent much of my time in the great outdoors, they first showed me the ropes in the office, but given my background, I learned quickly and moved to the outdoors portion of my duties. For a while, there were no major incidents, just some calls to dispatch some coyotes that had been harassing livestock, taking chickens in the dead of night. In one instance, a coyote made its way into someone's home through a dog door. It killed their dog in the living room, then left. That's pure insanity if you ask me. Never heard of a coyote brave enough to enter someone's home. My tenth or so instance in the field is when weird things began to happen to me. There was this pack of coyotes. They'd been killing goats and sheep at a local apple farm multiple times a week. This apple farm contained thousands of acres of apple and peach orchard and ran a successful business selling apple-only products and was well-loved by the community. People driving through town would stop just to get some apple cider ice cream from this little retail barn the farm runs. Anyway, the goats were important, as things like goat's milk are a common commodity, and the wool from the sheep allowed them to hand-make children's toys that kids loved, including my own. This farm orchard is located at the base of a large mountain range, totaling approximately 10,000 feet in elevation and a large canyon right down the middle where freezing gusts of wind like to shoot down right into town. I knew the coyotes were most active about one to two hours or so before the sun came up. I drove my truck through the apple orchard and I got stuck in the snow. There was yet another blizzard that year, totaling about 70 feet of snowfall since October. Despite this heavy snow, it was fairly warm, 32 degrees, a rare day off without large gusts of wind from the canyon, which would play to my advantage. I got out of my truck and took a big breath of crisp winter air. Large snowflakes were already piling onto my hair and glasses. My feet crunched on the powdery snow. This was dry snow, the kind you can't quite make snowmen out of. I grabbed my AR-15 from the back of the truck. I had it painted white to match my white camis, which I wore to blend in with the snow. Now, coyotes are extremely clever and can quite easily detect you, so even small details, like a camouflaged gun, are necessary. My feet crunched all the way to the edge of the orchard, which overlooked a large field. I'd already measured the distance, 500 yards to the edge, before the next outcropping of trees, about 300 yards to the livestock pen 
where the goats and sheep were on the right side of the field, and about 400 yards to another portion of the orchard on the left side of that field. I'd spent some time training at those ranges, and I was confident the rifle would perform well at those ranges, with my chosen bullet weight. My assumption was the coyotes traveled from the canyon down into the orchard on the left and crossed the field to get to the livestock. I hunkered down behind a log, now completely covered in snow, and I began to wait. The snowfall piled on my back and legs, making me invisible before long. I waited about 45 minutes in that spot before I finally saw movement. I flipped the illumination on my 8-power optic. It was specially formulated for predator hunting, and I had it dialed in perfectly at a 500-yard range and anywhere closer. I aimed down the optic and saw I wasn't looking at coyotes, but a herd of deer, all antlerless, grazing. Obviously, they had just swiped some rotting apples left over from the fall. Suddenly, I saw one of them perk up, ears swiveling to and fro. Then it snorted. All at once, they all ran back into the orchard where they came from. I immediately thought, okay, here come the coyotes. But nothing came sauntering into the field. I sat quietly. That's when I smelled it, the smell of sewage and body odor, or maybe a skunk. Either way, it was an unbearable stench. The fact I could smell anything with my frozen nose in that dry air was remarkable. I heard the goats begin to vocalize, obviously distressed. Then I saw it. I had to look more than once and try to blink the imagination out of my eyes. Through my optic, I saw a large man leaving the livestock pen, carrying a dead goat over his shoulder. It was a full moon, and the snow wasn't affecting my vision. I saw that man, muscular, hairy, and nude, with matted hair where the goat's blood had been pouring out all over his back. I had been nice and warm up until that moment, but it was then that my blood ran cold. I waited until he crossed the field and entered the orchard on the left. I stood up and walked quickly but quietly back to my truck. I kept the AR in my lap as I started it. Then I remembered I got stuck on my approach. I turned on my light bar and floodlights, waiting until sunrise, before I would finally get out and attempt to get myself unstuck. A couple of hours later, after the sun came up and I was finally unstuck, I made my way to visit the farmer to let him know that I was unsuccessful in finding the coyotes, and I left it at that. I was asked to return to finish the job later in the week, but I conveniently called out that day. My boss took the shift instead. To this day, I'm curious as to what he saw. The last guy before me probably saw it, too. Intruder in the Barn From M This happened when I was about 13 years old. I'm a girl who used to ride horses, and I started to work at the barn I rode at when I was only 11. My parents were okay with this. After all, there were always older girls or adult owners around, and it was in a safe area of the town we lived in. At the front of the property was the house that the owners lived in, and the driveway to the barn went right past the house. You could see in when driving by. Past the barn, at the other end of the pastures, was a public park that the owners had permission to bring the horses into. This story took place one night when I was working. My friend, who also rode at that barn, had agreed to stay with me, since the older girl I was scheduled with had gone home sick. It was dark out already, and in the middle of winter. The barn wasn't heated either, so it was freezing in there. It was about 8.30 p.m. on a Sunday, which meant there were no lessons that day, so the barn was empty. It was just me and my friend. We were finishing up feeding the horses and sweeping the aisles when we heard the doors to the indoor arena around the corner creak shut. We didn't think much of it, 
since we had seen the owner's son and his friend in the barn earlier in the evening. Maybe they'd come back, we thought. After that, we began to hear footsteps and shuffling down around the corner. And when I was giving the last horse its hay, I heard the arena door creak open again. We swept the loose hay off the floor and headed around the corner to the main aisle, where the doors to the indoor arena were. I started to become a little wary then, because we didn't see the owner's son just yet, nor his friend. We decided to go see if by chance one of the doors leading outside in the arena was left open by accident. Perhaps the wind was blowing it open and shut. The arena was pitch black, and I shone the flashlight from my phone around. Lo and behold, the doors that led outside were shut. There wasn't any way that the wind or any other natural force could have just opened and shut those doors, not to mention they were quite heavy. We peered into the pitch black arena as best we could with my phone's flashlight. We tried to see if the boys were just trying to scare us. Then we heard footsteps again in the aisle of the barn. This time, they were accompanied by clattering and banging on the walls. The hairs on my neck started to rise, and I could see my friend was visibly scared too. I checked my phone for any texts from my parents, as they should have been almost there to pick us up. Some of the horses were beginning to get agitated, pacing in their stalls and snorting angrily. I looked at my friend, and we knew what the other was thinking. I turned off my flashlight, and, hesitantly, we tiptoed back into the barn, peering around the corner into the main aisle. My heart caught in my throat when I saw the back of a shadow turn around the corner at the back of the barn. I grabbed my friend's arm and dragged her as I ran towards the entrance to the barn. Once we reached it, I flung the door open and slammed it shut once we were safely outside. Our boots crunched on the freshly fallen snow, and the cold air stung our faces, but I wasn't going to wait one more minute inside that barn. I'm not sure what I saw, but I knew in my gut it wasn't good. The darkness outside enveloped us. We huddled together against the wall of the barn, trying to hide while we waited. I was about to suggest running towards the owner's house, but relief flooded my body when I finally saw the headlights of my parents' car coming up the driveway. You know, it was probably just the guy scaring us, I said to my friend. Yeah, I know. They'll make fun of us for this. My friend responded. We started laughing about it as we clambered into my parents' car. The tension left our bodies with the warmth of the car and the comfort of my parents' presence. I would have believed we were right and forgotten about the whole incident if it wasn't for when we drove past the owner's house. We saw through the window her, her husband, her son, and his friend sitting at the kitchen table eating dinner. My heart skipped a beat and my head whipped over to look at my friend. The look on her face told me that she had seen it too. We sat there in fear for the rest of the car ride home. We tried to rationalize it for the rest of the night, but the only two conclusions I have come to are, one, a spirit or ghost was in that barn. The older girls have told us that an old farmer haunts the barn, but I always thought they were messing with us because we were younger. They had all claimed to have experienced the same things we had, seemingly always at night after dark, like it happened for us. The footsteps, doors opening and shutting for no reason, banging, agitated horses, and some even claimed to hear thundering horse hooves in the indoor arena when no real horses were in there. And two, someone else was in the barn with us sneaking around. If another rider or someone who boarded a horse there had shown up, we would have known they were there. The owners and their son and his friend were inside the house eating dinner, though. It wouldn't be the first time a random person had wandered up from the park at the end of the property and snuck into the barn. 
the thought of a random man hiding in the barn and snooping around while my friend and I were also there alone made my stomach turn. Looking back now that I'm in my 20s, my parents would have never been okay with their 13-year-old daughter and her friend all alone in the barn late at night. We just never know who or what may be lurking around. The following are two stories submitted by Anthony1997. Warning, the following story contains depictions of violence against animals. A Skinwalker in the Pig Pen This encounter happened half a year ago. It has caused me to move away from the home I grew up in, the woods I've always played in, hunted in, etc. A place that was for the most part always happy was torn to bits. My mama is full-blooded Cherokee and moved off the reserve to marry my papa, so I'm no stranger to folktales and stories of skinwalkers and so on. Now, I'm from what most people call the sticks. It's an hour's drive to get into town and three hours to the nearest big city. As such, we raised our own chickens, pigs, cows, etc. for milk, eggs, and meat. One week, the pigs were beginning to act off. They weren't rolling around in the mud. They were all huddled in the corner of their pen and did not want to move, not even when we brought them food. Then one morning, I got up to go tin to the chores, collect eggs, milk the cows, and feed the pigs. But when I made it to the pig pen, I found two pigs lying dead, chunks of flesh ripped from them. I sighed told my dad about it, and we removed the dead pigs from the pen and buried them. Supernatural things aren't uncommon where I live, but this seemed like a pack of coyotes just got into the pig pen, so I left it at that, and I set up the next night with my shotgun, watching the pig pen, ready to shoot anything that got too near, and hopefully scare off the rest. But nothing happened that night. In fact, nothing would happen for the next month. It was all normal, other than the fact that coyotes were howling more than usual. During that time, I bought an RV. I moved it into the backyard until I could find a spot to stay at for good. One night, I heard the pigs squealing a lot, and the coyotes were going mad. They sounded really close. By the time I got up, threw on some clothes, and grabbed my shotgun... The coyote howls and pig squeals had morphed into a single sound, and it was doing this over and over. I walked out into the pig pen and looked them over. Nothing seemed out of place yet, until I caught a glimpse of a pig out of the pen. I turned and chuckled at it, saying, Come on, bud, let's get you in there before the coyotes get you. I took a step toward it, and then... It let out a bone-chilling screech. I stopped, dead in my tracks. That's not the sound pigs make. I readied my shotgun, and I realized it was looking at me. I could feel heat from its eyes, staring into my soul. I aimed and shot, but it didn't flinch. Instead, it stood up and laughed. I could see legs that looked more human with hooves for feet and hands. It screeched again, and I took off running. I made it back to my RV and slammed the door. I looked out the window then, and I saw that thing slowly walking to my RV door. It tried to open it, and it began to beat against it, screeching. The RV felt as if it was going to be tipped over when suddenly it stopped. It wasn't long before I began to hear crying. This sounded much more human, but also like it was being run through an old TV that was thrown into a bathtub of jello. I looked out, and it was still staring at me, but now it was crying. I pushed a chair against the door and went to lie down, trying to ignore it. It followed me to the closest window, continuing to cry and now occasionally tapping on the glass. This went on for a long time, but stopped all at once. 
with the return of silence, I finally fell asleep. But the next day, when I went to check on the pigs, I found them all dead, torn apart. To this day, I'm convinced it was a skinwalker. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. UFO Experience in Ontario, Canada I'd like to share an encounter my father and I had with a UFO back when I was about 12 or 13. This experience happened in southern Ontario, Canada, in a rural place. It's important that I give some background leading up to the encounter. My sister and I have always had, I guess you could say, a tumultuous relationship. She was a year and a half younger than me, and we were both the only children our parents had. We never got along and have vastly different personalities. She was honestly a bit abusive at times, but we both were difficult with one another. My parents didn't tend to pick a side, but I was always a bit closer with my dad and she with my mother. My sister and I would have loud screaming matches that lasted hours and sometimes would result in physical fights. Neither of us was perfect. I don't think I was completely innocent, but she was much more violent than I was. I liked to use words, and she used her fists. She'd throw chairs, and I'd fling insults. I'm not proud of myself, but that was how it was for quite a long time between the two of us. This one night, the fighting got really out of hand, and I really can't remember every little detail except it felt as if I was in hell and I just wanted it to end. It all led up to my father and mother arguing with one another. I remember my mother hitting my dad, and that was the only time my parents ever did anything like that, ever. I didn't want my dad to be hurt because of my bad attitude, and I ran between them to protect my father. My mother slapped me a few times, and there was some more screaming, and they argued more. My father and I left our house in our rural area and drove to the nearby city to get some food and just decompress. We were there in about half an hour, getting some McDonald's, and we parked the car in a lot. My father was exhausted and so was I, so he suggested we stay in the car and go to sleep for a while. It was around 2.30am at that point, but even though I was afraid of my sister and my mother at the moment and didn't want to fight anymore. I was much more afraid of being in a city at night. I begged my father to drive home, and he was hesitant because of how tired he was, but I really didn't think I could sleep in the car in an area that scared me the whole night. So eventually we did drive back home. We were nearly to our house, which is in a farming area. We had to drive down past a cornfield, and behind that field, there is a forested area and it was very far from the tree line to the road. It was completely quiet, and there were no other cars on the road, and of the few houses, none had any lights on that night. I don't remember which of us pointed it out first, but it was probably me, since I was looking out the window on the side facing the field. I saw it in the trees, this large orb, Larger than our car, but it was small enough that it could have been any light at that distance. It was strange how much it captivated us. I mean, it was just a light, wasn't it? My father stopped the car, and we just gazed at this bright light, expecting nothing to happen at all. But something did. It began to move closer to us, to the road. It couldn't have taken it longer than two minutes at all, it made a direct beeline straight for our car, or rather, to us. I still remember how odd it was, the way it moved. It was like something out of a science fiction film. It wasn't at all natural, nor even like something made by man. That's the strangest thing about it. You know how a plane or a drone or any man-made craft would experience subtle movements, like the wind or because of the environment surrounding it. This wasn't like that at all. It moved in a perfect line, not a single error of any kind, no small fluctuation visible to either me or my father. I didn't notice due to my shock, but my father later informed me 
it was emitting a low buzzing sound of some kind as it moved. All I noticed was how precisely and perfectly it moved in the space around it, around us. It was just too perfect to be something made by man. I knew that right away. In less than two minutes, it was right at the edge of the field. It was paralyzing and terrifying, yet so amazing, too. It wasn't that I couldn't move or leave, but it was like something had reached right up into my mind and had overridden every instinct I had. My father and I were in a trance-like state while we watched, but then for some reason, and I don't understand if it was my logical mind or something like a guardian angel, or even the craft itself, but I got these flashes of memories through my mind, and they only told me one thing. Run. I saw these memories of TV shows I'd watched when I was young. Particularly, it was a memory of a scene from a show reenacting a couple's encounter with a UFO, in a scenario almost exactly like the one we found ourselves in. I realized, if we didn't get out of there, something awful would occur, and we would be, in all likelihood, abducted. I did not want that to happen, and apparently something else out there didn't either, because this didn't feel like my own mind or spirit telling me that. It was more like something else was trying to prevent the object from abducting us. I then screamed at my father, repeating the voice's command of run. I shouted it as loud as I could, and thank God, it broke him from the trance-like state. He hit the gas, flooring it, and we drove away. I looked back to see if that object was chasing us. By that time, it had made it to the road, and I was convinced it would follow us back home, but it didn't. Instead, it just floated away across the other side and disappeared. We made it home, and we were both just shocked and terrified. It seemed like a dream. So for years following, I asked my father if it was all real, if that really happened. It was just too unbelievable. It moved so perfectly and so much faster than any normal vehicle ever could, and it glowed so brightly too. Not just that, but it appeared to possess intelligence, as it only moved when my father and I began observing it. So many questions went through my mind. Was it a UFO? Was it some government technology that they were testing here? The UFO theory makes more sense to me. It seemed to be capable of moving without being affected by the space around it. I have so many questions, and I don't understand it at all. I've always had the sinking feeling that one day I'll see it again. The encounter actually improved my life for the better, though. My sister and I stopped fighting for good, and our relationship improved dramatically after the event. It has had some negative effects on me, too, though. See, after I saw something so amazing and wonderful, everything else seems a bit boring in comparison. I mean, it was seemingly out of this world. Something like that is just so amazing to witness that it shakes up your entire worldview. I have no idea if it was aliens or something else, but it was really something to see. I want to see something else as amazing like that one day. Sometimes I look out at the night sky, wondering if it'll show up again. I just want to know what it wanted with us. I hope some people can find my story and realize they aren't alone. These things do happen, and you're not crazy. There are things we cannot understand fully, and that's okay. The world would be a bit more boring without these things, don't you think? Warning. The following story contains depictions of harm against animals. The Pig Farm Werewolf From Benji B. The story I'm about to tell you happened when I was around 11 or 12 years old. So the year would have been 1999 or possibly 2000. I live in central Sweden. My parents had been divorced for many years, and the day of my encounter, my younger sister and I were visiting our dad at his farm. He raises slaughter pigs there for one of the country's biggest meat producers. 
I've always loved animals, and I enjoyed helping out at the farm, feeding the animals and cuddling with the piglets. My dad had built the pig housing just a couple of years before. Now, when you entered through the main entrance, you would find yourself at the beginning of a long corridor, with four doors on the right side and two doors on the left, with one door at the end of the corridor leading out to the back side of the building. The first door on the right led to an office and staff room, and the second door led to a storage room. The following two doors on the right and the last door on the left led to the three what we called pig stables, called stable number one, two, and three, each with 48 separate pens where the pigs were housed. The first door on the left went to the barn where we stored food and straw for the animals. Now, the way this farm worked was that we received pregnant sows a week or two before they were expected to give birth. And when the piglets were old enough, the sows were sent to the other farms to rest for a few months before they were impregnated again. The piglets stayed with us until they were old enough to be sent off to slaughter. Now back to the story. The day of my encounter was a very cold winter day, probably around December or January. The ground was covered in a thick layer of snow, and the sky was clear. A perfect winter day. My sister and I had arrived at our dad's place around lunchtime the same day. That afternoon, we were in the stables, helping out with the chores. I remember that in stable number one, it held slaughter pigs that were maybe a couple of months old. In stable number two, we had pregnant sows expecting to give birth at any day, and stable number three was empty. At the time, it had just been cleaned and prepared for a new delivery of pregnant sows to arrive within a few days. I remember my sister being so bored that day. The only thing she liked to do was cuddle and play with the newborn piglets, of which we had none at the time. My dad was in the empty stable, number three, working on a broken gate to one of the pens, which had been damaged when the slaughter pigs that were housed there earlier were moved. I had just fed the pigs in stable two when my dad told me that he had found one of the slaughter pigs injured. Now, it was quite common for them to get injured when they're in the teenage stage of life, trying to establish dominance and being very eager and playful. But it was unusual for them to get any serious injuries. Usually, it was just smaller scratches and bite marks. When he told me that this pig probably had a broken front leg, my heart dropped because I knew that there was nothing we could do and the pig would have to be put down to end its misery. I hated that. It was not often it happened, but when it did, I always teared up. I helped my dad to find the injured pig, and we carried it out through the door to the backside of the building. Out on the backside, there was a big round manure tank, approximately 15 meters in diameter and several meters deep partly buried in the ground with just about a meter of the top above ground level. We carried the pig to the other side of the tank, and my dad brought a butchery bolt gun, but I refused to stay out there while my dad did what he had to do. I went back inside, and I continued to feed the pigs, listening to music, trying to get my mind off of what happened to that poor pig. After a while, my dad came in to tell me he needed to go to his workshop to get some tools to fix the gate, and he asked if I wanted to stay here or come with him. His workshop was where he stored and maintained his agricultural machines and equipment. It was a 10-minute drive from the farm, and he said he would be back in half an hour. So I told him I would stay. I helped him carry some tools to his car, then watched him and my sister drive away. It was mid-afternoon by then, but it was already dark outside. Now I was alone on the farm, but I didn't mind that. We lived just south of the Arctic Circle, and in the winter we only have a few hours of sunlight from the late morning to early afternoon, so I was used to the short winter days and the darkness. At the moment the sky was still clear, but it was now covered with bright stars and the moon, which looked big and bright and more beautiful than usual. I went back inside to the staff room 
to eat one of the sandwiches my dad had brought for us. After that, I went back to start cleaning out the pens in stable one and two. These stables had slatted floors that could be opened to scrape down any dung and straw, which was then automatically transported out to the open manure tank on the backside. Because of the freezing temperature, I first had to go out on the back to start a circulation pump to keep the liquid manure from freezing in the pipes. I went out the back, opened the hatch to the control panel, and started the pump. I then closed the hatch, and I looked across the manure tank at the pig lying there in the snow. A dim light shone through the windows from the lights inside and from the moon lighting up the area. The snow under the pig's head was now colored red, and I actually felt a bit relieved that he was no longer in pain. I went back inside, starting to clean out the pins. After about half an hour, I'd finished the two stables. My dad and sister weren't back from the workshop yet, so I decided to go to the staff room to have a Coke from the refrigerator and watch some TV until they came back. We still had some work to do, but I felt I deserved a break. They'd probably be back any minute. After a few minutes of watching some boring reality show and drinking Coke and having my second sandwich, I remembered I left the circulation pump to the manure tank on out back. I put down my sandwich and went out to the corridor towards the back door to turn it off. I opened the back door, stepping out, and I was just about to open the hatch to the control panel when I saw something moving in the corner of my right eye just across the manure tank. I looked over towards it, and immediately my heart felt as if it stopped. My entire body froze from fear. What I saw was something I had never seen before, something I hope against hope that I'll never have to see again. Over on the other side of the manure tank, there was a huge animal leaning over the carcass of the pig we'd left out there earlier in the day. The animal faced away from me, so I could only see its back. At first, I thought it was a brown bear, but it was way bigger, and it had a tail with long hair on it, like the tail of a golden retriever. This animal was covered in dark gray and black fur, with a wide, muscular upper body, and I could see the steam from its breath rising in the cold air. Suddenly, the animal stood up on its hind legs. It really was huge. I would guess maybe 220 to 240 centimeters tall. It turned its head slightly to the right, nose towards the sky, and it opened its mouth to toss a piece of meat down its throat. The head was definitely the head of a wolf, but much bigger and darker. It had long furry ears pointing upwards, and a long snout with big canine teeth. We have both wild wolves and bears living in this area, but this, oh, this was something else, something bigger, stronger, something that gave off an evil vibe. The animal leaned down over the pig carcass again, continuing to feast on its meal. I realized it hadn't yet noticed me standing there outside the door behind it, I was so scared, I didn't know if I should scream, cry, or faint. My body was still frozen and just wouldn't move. Finally, I found the strength to silently walk backwards inside and softly close and lock the door. Even when I was inside, I tried to run through the corridor as quietly as possible to lock the front door as well. I did not want to give that monster any chance to get inside. I walked over to the door to stable number two that had windows facing the back side where the creature had been. I looked into the stable through the window in the door. The windows in the wall were about two meters up from the floor. From there, I could only see the steam from its breath rising in the air outside. Suddenly, some of the pigs saw me through the door window and started to grunt loudly. Soon, all of them were grunting very loud, as they always do when they see a person at the door, 
They were excited, hoping I was bringing them more food. I looked back to the windows, just in time to see the creature stand up and turn towards the window, looking in the direction of the sound of the pigs. I could only see the top of its head and the ears when it walked up to the window. I quickly sat down on the floor in front of the door, and now, silently, I cried. I started to crawl on the floor back to the staff room to get to the phone and call my dad. Remember, this was around the year 2000, when a 12-year-old wouldn't have a mobile phone. I reached the door and realized that there are two big windows in the staff room, windows that didn't have any curtains or blinds. I didn't dare go inside, risking that the creature would turn up on the front side of the building and see me through the window. I sat down in the corner between the doors to the staff room and the front door. At that point, I could not hold it in anymore. I began to cry like never before. I was sure this monster would get inside, and if it did, it would hear me crying, and it would find me. Suddenly, the door handle on the front door violently turned, and something tried to push the door open. I screamed, and the handle turned again, followed by two loud thuds and an attempt to break the door open. I was sure then that I was going to die. When the door handle turned once more, I heard hard knocking on the door, followed by my dad's voice calling out for me. I rushed up, unlocking and opening the door, telling my dad and sister to hurry inside and to lock the door after they did. When I turned to my dad, he saw that I'd been crying and he asked what was wrong. I told him the whole story of what I called the werewolf, and he looked at me, not saying a word, then looked at my sister. He looked back at me and asked if I am done feeding and cleaning the pins. I nodded. He nodded back, thoughtfully looking down at the floor for a few seconds, then back at us, telling us that the rest of the work can wait until tomorrow. Then he took us back home. In the evening, he went by himself to give the pigs their evening meal. My sister and I watched him from the upper floor of the house as he walked across the yard, hoping that the creature would not be hiding in the dark, ready to attack my dad. I remember him looking all around him with a flashlight as he walked. When he came back, I asked if he had seen the dead pig on the back side. He said he had, rather what was left of it. He said it looked as if some sort of predator had found it and dragged the rest of it into the forest. After that incident, my dad was very clear we were not allowed to go outside after dark. As I got older, I've been thinking a lot about that day and how my dad reacted after I told him what happened, followed by the new strict rules about never going outside after dark. Did he know this creature existed? Did he know that it lurked in the forests surrounding the farm? Had he seen it himself? My dad later passed away from leukemia some years later, before I had a chance to ask him about it. But I'm sure he knew something about the creature I saw that day. She only wanted some company. From Adrift This is a story my grandmother, or Nanima as I call her, often narrates at dinner parties. Everyone in the family loves it, so we get to hear it often, in all its terrifying glory at get-togethers. Nanima is a good sport about it, maybe because she's managed to put 60 years between then and now. But even today, I can see in her a remnant of that terrified yet brave young woman she had been all those years back in that fateful summer of 62. To give you some context, my Nanima's family, that is to say, my mother's side of the family, hails from one of the northernmost states of India, nestled in the arms of the Himalayas. Surrounded by the beauty of its mountains and their lush green forests, the hilly settlements across this region boast centuries worth of mystical tales that have always fascinated lowlanders like us. Perhaps for me and my cousins, 
Nanima's tales have been a way to stay connected to our land, a land so many of us haven't been able to call home, not since our families traveled south, settling across the various metropolitan cities of the country. It's been a while since I last heard this story, but I've heard it so many times by now that it almost feels like my own. So I have no hesitation in putting it to words the way Nanima would tell it. I'll be her voice, and I'll narrate the story in the closest approximation of her words as translated from our mother tongue. The year was 1962. I had just turned 18 in February. As the only daughter of an influential landowner with modern ideas, I was one of the few girls in the village to take up a job in the nearby town. Most of my friends had been married off by then, and I was often asked to pump out babies of my own by well-meaning neighbors and relatives. But my father was a no-nonsense man who wanted his children to be independent and well-off. So I found a job at a government school, nearly an hour-long walk from home. Now, this was back in the early 60s in rural North India. No one in my village had a telephone back then, let alone a vehicle to call their own. My father had a bicycle he often rode to his farmlands, but none of his children were granted this luxury until they could manage to earn it for themselves. I lived in a small village of farmers and cowherders, which was situated on one side of an expansive valley, and my place of work was a larger town that lay on the other side of it. The journey from one end to the other took anywhere between 45 minutes to one hour on foot and I gladly walked this winding mountain path twice every day. I woke up as early as four to do my bit around the farm before beginning to dress up for work. I'd be on my way by six sharp, but I would never leave the house without packing pinches of uncooked rice and two pieces of cloth torn from a roll of fabric set aside for this very purpose. I would religiously check my bag twice before leaving to make sure I'd placed these bundles inside. I could forget my employee ID for the day, but I could never afford to leave behind these small packs of offerings. The road to town was tough yet hardly a challenge for someone who had grown up in these parts. It wound around the mountain, cut through a valley of flowers, and tapered downwards to where the town sat next to a massive lake. This route I undertook was one out of two traversable paths connecting my village to the town. And the only reason I chose this one over the other was the absolute necessity of saving time. No matter the reservations about certain elements along this route that were more than just a mere hindrance. You see, the path of my choice was stunning beyond gorgeous and it was also comparatively short, an hour's walk between its two ends as opposed to the nearly three hour long trek along the alternate passage. But there was this specific stretch almost in the middle of the route that was capable of ending one's journey forever, and there was only one no way to traverse it, a method that had been in use for decades, perhaps even centuries, it seemed. At the 30-minute mark, a small glacier-fed stream almost cut the route into two halves, barely 50 paces in width and passable via a small footbridge built of squeaking wood and frayed ropes obviously in desperate need of maintenance. The stream itself was nothing special, although it was a part of a larger river. People barely called it that given how insignificant it seemed in that brief stretch along a curve in the road. Its waters were fresh but rarely spirited enough to do more than just gently lap at its banks. But there was hardly anything insignificant about this place. At this juncture, I would pluck one of the two bundles from my purse I'd stand for a minute or two at the mouth of this bridge, praying for safety in my journey to all the gods I knew of, and I would bend down and place the bundle gently next to my feet before carefully making my way across. The rule at this point was to never look back, not even a glance. From this point onwards, anyone crossing the bridge had to continue looking forward until they reached their intended destination no matter where or how far away from the bridge that was. One look back, just one fleeting glance, and it was believed in these parts that you would never be able to reach the end of your journey. 
The tale had been a thing in our region for at least two generations before me. Of that, I was certain. There were variations, of course, as is the case with stories seldom put to paper. Some believe it was a restless spirit, craving companionship, while others called it a demon, keen to make playthings of those foolish enough to cross its path. There were also stories of mothers who had lost their children to hunger and to those mountains, leaving their tortured spirits wandering across these valleys for eternity. More mouths meant bolder stories, and in these mountains I called home, even the skies could not be a limit for the people's imagination. No one really knew who or what haunted that bridge, prowling its diminished length for God knows what, but it was certain that whoever or whatever it was, it had to be appeased for safe passage. The footbridge was barely a few meters long, but in order to cross it safely, one had to lay down an offering of cooked or uncooked rice before setting foot on it. At its head, where the bridge met land and where I began my trek across every morning for five days a week, the ground was scattered with tiny bundles wrapped in everything, from newspaper clippings to torn pieces of clothing, evidence of all those who had taken and continued to take this route. Most of these bundles would be gone by evening, right in time for my walk back across. And although I'm aware this is no proof of some entity haunting the area, what with the possibility of hungry opportunists lurking nearby being high, I doubt anyone belonging to this region would have had the guts to touch these offerings in light of what had been said of the place for generations. Besides, there was also the fact that the place made me feel physically ill every time I so much as approached it five mornings and evenings a week. To this day, I shoot down any and every explanation by my family members aimed at rationalizing my experiences of those days. I see where they come from, but I've always and will always stand by the genuineness of my experiences. I couldn't have induced or faked the fear trickling down my spine like ice-cold water, could I? I had never been spooked by all those ghost stories my older brothers often told me as a kid so there must have been some element of truth in this tale to set me on edge like that. Shaken by the local legends and by my own real experiences around this area, I had never once forgotten my daily two packs of offerings or messed up the tiny ritualistic procedure at the bridge. I simply couldn't afford to do so, what with my own thundering heart around this area always reminding me of what was truly at stake. Those wraps of uncooked rice and two pouches would be left without fail every day. It had become muscle memory over the years. The day of the incident, it had rained that morning. It was an important day at school too, some kind of audit involving the local authorities. I was running late. As a result, I was stressed beyond belief when I rummaged inside my bag for the morning's offering. In my haste, I ended up dropping both bundles on the ground at once. I froze on the spot for a few minutes. There was this great rushing in my ears that nearly widened out my vision. Now this may seem like an overreaction. I could have just easily picked up the extra pack and gone on my way. But I've always had this thing where I hesitate to take back what I've already given, whether intentionally or not and with something as charged as an offering meant to keep something at bay, I was even more hesitant to touch the fallen bundle. I was cold and terrified under the untimely rain, half expecting something ghastly to pop out of the water and pull me under right then and right there. But nothing happened. Not within the next few seconds, nor an indeterminate stretch of minutes that followed as I stood there, unsure, unsure of how to proceed. As the clock ticked and my mind began to clear some of the terror-induced fog it had let gather, I began to see the third and obvious alternative I had failed to notice in my state. I could just let it be and take the longer route back home in the evening. Taking a breath to brace myself, I made my way across the bridge, my every step taken with careful thought and planning. But nothing happened. Not then, not later in the day, it was an ordinary day to beat all ordinary days. 
but I still felt like I was teetering on the edge, barely seconds away from tipping over. Come evening, when it was time for me to return, I had half a mind to stay over at school because the prospect of taking the longer route home in the failing light was no better. But it wasn't an option. The almost three hour long route that circumvented the mountain wasn't as taxing as the shorter route, cutting right through the valley, but 30 past five in the upper reaches of the Himalayas, it was most definitely a challenge for a young woman traveling alone. There had been no known cases of any untoward business occurring along this route, but the inky darkness in the hills and wild forests can be a threat all on its own. I wasn't usually the kind to get spooked, but the day hadn't been usual by any means. I was seeing monsters in my shadow, hearing footsteps in the swirling of leaves, and with the ground still soft with the morning's rain beneath my feet, I felt as if I was seconds away from being grabbed unaware. But as had been the case that morning, nothing happened. Apart from the general creepiness of the night and the seemingly absolute darkness of a cloud-covered sky, my journey home was uneventful. Much of the terror I'd been experiencing was a product of my racing mind, awash as it was with shadows that I was tracing with my eyes because I expected to find them everywhere I turned to look. Later that night, when I finally fell into a fitful sleep somewhere around two, I couldn't help but think if this was the silence before the storm. The next morning, it began with a sort of tremor in my belly, like the one you get when you've eaten something wrong and your body's just begun to process the wrongness of it before the churning and cramping starts. I packed two extra pouches this time and placed them in a second zipped compartment inside my bag to be sure. As I prepared to leave, a fierce debate raged inside my mind. I was half tempted to ask one of my brothers to accompany me to work that day, but I rejected the idea the very next second. There was no way I was going to alert anyone to my troubles or appear weak in front of them. Taking the longer route was out of the question. I was wiser today than I was before and I was fully prepared. So there I was, taking my usual route to work, and all along the half-hour trek to the stream with the footbridge, I was skittish, distressed, and constantly looking over my shoulder. At the bridge, I performed my usual ceremony, with deliberate movements, and I chanted a mantra for courage under my breath. Maybe I was imagining things, but when I bent over to place the small sack at the mouth of the bridge, I felt a strange sense of peace wash over me a feeling that let me know that I was on the right path, doing the right thing. This was in such stark contrast to my anxiety from merely minutes before that I found myself yet again rooted to the spot for minutes that felt like hours. The peace didn't last long. I had only to cross the bridge for the nerves to return, and with them this time was the distinct sensation that I was being watched and followed. It was nearly impossible to smother my instinct to turn around and look, but I managed somehow. Even today, I won't be able to tell you exactly what it was that I was sensing in that moment. It was something like the soft patter of childlike footfalls on wet earth, barely a few paces behind me. But even if I hadn't been able to sense or hear a thing, I would have known its presence like I knew there was a sun climbing the skies to my right. I knew that not taking this route home yesterday had been a mistake. I was so relieved to reach school unscathed that day. I was shaken and barely keeping it together. If my colleagues sensed something off, they had been kind enough to keep it to themselves. They were too busy with their own responsibilities to bother. Besides, by lunch break, Something else entirely had ended up capturing the attention and imagination of every person present within the school compound that day. There had been a break-in, apparently. Some wretch had managed to get past both the guard and the eight-feet-tall walls surrounding the property. The guard was adamant he had not been slacking, and given his stellar record over the years, the administration was disinclined to think otherwise. Nonetheless, it was difficult to imagine how a child, a little girl at that, 
had managed to not only outsmart a grown man, but also vault such a high barrier in the process. The word was that she had been kept, for lack of alternate arrangements, in an empty classroom, locked from the outside because she had grown violent and bitten the guard when he had tried escorting her out. She'd apparently been spotted in one of the primary classrooms, just seconds before her capture, going through the tiffin boxes of students who had left class for PE period. When the guard had tried to reach her, she lunged at him, digging her teeth into his outstretched hands. I didn't join my colleagues when they rushed to the spot to take stock of the situation. I knew somehow that I would not like what I'd see there. I waited for them with dread, barely reading the papers and forms I was attempting to file. When they returned with excitement shining in their eyes, I felt my heart jump right up to my throat. Ten different people gave ten different accounts of the incident. There were exaggerations and massive flights of imagination involved, but at the core, there was this one bit of information confirmed by even the skeptics that made my blood run cold. According to many, the child had eaten but one thing out of the nearly 30 tiffin boxes she had opened that afternoon. Rice. My journey home that evening was just as tense as the morning's trip, except this time, I was sure I felt something brush against my palms intermittently, as if someone was trying to grab my hand before deciding against it. I couldn't see or hear a thing, but I was sure I was not alone. You could argue it was the wind, or perhaps my body's natural response to stress, but I can assure you it had been a very real sensation. I knew in that moment as I walked towards the footbridge yet again that I couldn't abandon this daily routine I'd built out of necessity, and that had now apparently become such an integral part of my life. My daily schedule had been noticed somehow, and if I were to continue existing peacefully here, I had to follow the rules I'd subjected myself to. I wasn't sure what the consequences of deviating from this path would be, but I wasn't eager to find out. Starting from that day to the following two years I worked at the school, I never once strayed from the path. Apart from the nearly negligible and occasional leaves I took, I always walked this route without fail, come rain, hail, or storms. But when has life ever been a constant? As the weeks turned to months, which then turned to years, I found myself prepared to transition from one phase to the next. In September of 1964, I was married to a government officer based in Delhi. In our village, this wedding was a grand celebration, and my father, in the spirit of marrying off his only daughter, left no stone unturned. In the chaos and excitement of beginning a new phase, I didn't have much thought to what moving out of this little village could mean, would mean. I was far too preoccupied with the excitement and uncertainties of beginning a married life, with the overwhelming sadness of leaving behind my home and childhood, so considerations of the supernatural variety were left far behind. When we arrived in Delhi, I was immediately picked up by a local women's collective that prepared and sold snacks like poppadums and pickles. I worked the front desk and helped around a bit with logistics and raw materials. It was rather surprising how quickly I'd adjusted to this new life and work environment, and for the first month following my recruitment, I didn't have even a second to sit back and inspect that little something that continued to gnaw at my insides. Not until the strange happenings began, and I was pulled back two years and hundreds of miles away into the arms of the Himalayas. It started with this one incident, where the guard at the front gate informed me I had a visitor asking for me right there at the entrance. When I reached the designated spot, there was no one to be found. The guard had looked just as surprised. According to him, the one asking for me had been a child dressed in tatters, which in itself was alarming. Just weeks after this, some women drying mangoes for the pickles heard a child crying somewhere in the terrace area, and upon investigating every corner of the open surface, along with the rooms attached to it on the topmost floor, they'd found nothing. No one. 
Two weeks after this, when the storage room had just been stacked up for the monthly output, an inspection round later in the day revealed that someone or something had cut through the rice stacks with a viciousness befitting a wild animal. Naturally, this last incident had me tossing and turning at nights for months. It had hit far too close to home and had shattered the bubble of peace I had built around myself, as if it wasn't going to pop with just a puff or breath. But what was I to do? I couldn't speak about my troubles to anyone, not even to my husband, who was a skeptic himself. My friends and colleagues would probably think I was making things up too. So I swallowed my fears and soldiered on, somewhat assured in the knowledge that whatever this was, it hadn't yet made contact when it could have easily done so any time over the years. There had to be a reason for that. Then I gave birth to my first child, and the rules of this game apparently changed. It was calm for the first few years, so much so that I began to think I'd forever put to rest that one chapter of my past. But my complacency soon got the better of me. 1969 was drawing to a close, and my daughter was months away from turning four. On the work front as well, my hands were full. My office had shifted its base of operations to a district about an hour's bus ride from home. So I was busy for 10 plus hours six times a week. To tackle the workload on both fronts, I'd ended up calling one of my mossies, or auntie, from the village to look after my daughter, and she'd made a home for herself in our guest room. Although fearless and competent, Masi would often complain to us about strange noises and missing objects around the house. I usually would not pay heed to this under the assumption it was the doing of a curious and rather naughty child. Perhaps I was also not ready to think too much about the reasons behind it, for fear of what might be revealed in the process. So things went on like this and my daughter spoke about making new friends around society that would often drop by to say hello. This wasn't unusual to me, because the people in our housing colony were indeed friendly and showered my daughter with love whenever they could. But then, one Saturday morning, something happened that changed my perception of these events. I woke up to a sound coming from the kitchen, and my sleep-addled mind was slow to catch on to the fact that my child wasn't in the room with me. This was one of those occasions where my husband had gone on a work trip, so it was just my auntie in the guest room and me and my daughter in my room. After a disorienting few minutes when I finally realized where the sound was coming from, I got to my feet in record time and I ran to the kitchen. I felt the ground taken right out from underneath my feet when I saw my child, my sweet, innocent toddler, out of her bed pudgy hands searching the cabinet beneath the counter and fists about to pry open the lid of a massive steel jar we used to store our rice. I don't really remember the weeks following that incident. My mind has probably blocked these memories because I was beyond terrified in those days. I do remember visits to temples and a cleansing puja performed by a family pundit at our place. I remember being scared of my own breathing at times, and I also remember anger. Oh yes, violent, bubbling anger at being troubled like this, and the urgent, almost maddening desire to do something, anything. A cousin's wedding back home provided the perfect opportunity for this intervention. I had finished making the plan before I'd even packed my suitcase for the week-long trip, and by the time I was cocooned in the warm sights of my old home, I'd managed to gather the courage to do what was needed to be done for the sake of my child. On one of those rare breaks between ceremonies, I expressed my desire to visit my old workplace to my mother. She promptly informed me about a new route that was under construction after the footbridge on the old one had crumbled earlier that year. I was beyond surprised to hear this, but I also thought it made perfect sense. In my mind, I was connecting the years spent in Delhi, the initial occurrences after my shift, the peaceful years that followed, 
and the recent pickup of activities at home right at the beginning of this year. I couldn't put my theory to words, but I still knew it all to be true. Determined, I arranged a massive bag of rice and propped it up on the back of a bicycle, borrowed from one of the workers who had been brought in for the dining arrangements. Finding my way back to the bridge was as easy as breathing, and despite the years between then and now, I still remembered every tree, every errant bush along the path like the back of my hand. I didn't make a show of dropping that sack of rice next to what remained of the bridge. It was barely there now, just bits erected on the sides that had been bent and splintered with age and the elements. I placed the sack as respectfully as I could, and then, for the first time, I sat on the damp earth, feet just inches away from the cold waters of the stream that was still as unremarkable as it had been half a decade ago. I didn't walk away, and I didn't stop myself from looking back. I followed none of the rules. I just sat there, looking straight ahead, anticipating those footfalls that never came. And as I sat, my heart thudding painfully against my throat. I prayed and I begged. I made requests and promises and I tried looking at this whole scenario from a different perspective. I remembered how painful my first few months had been in Delhi, away from the home where I had grown up. I thought of my family and imagined how difficult it would be for me to leave them behind, to watch them leave and never return. To this day, I am assured in my belief that this hadn't been my intended train of thought. These feelings had just come to me in that moment, gifted to me by some unseen force. In the weeks that followed, I got that bridge rebuilt. I took some more days off work and mustered whatever resources and contacts I could to get the job done. Workers from other villages had to be called in because those living in the region refused to even entertain the idea. But the fact that there was no obvious protest against my decision was a testimony to how people around town had been awaiting for someone to take the initiative. If there was one thing scarier than a haunting, it was a wandering, destructive spirit, and no one wanted to be considered responsible for preventing the reconstruction of the bridge. When I returned to Delhi after my eventful trip home, I was far too engrossed in work for the first few weeks to think about my experiences and contemplate the future. Perhaps somewhere in the back of my mind, I had known it was all over. I heard my daughter laugh with abandon, and I found peace in the soft tinkling of her laughter. The cloud that seemed to have been passing over my family had finally dissipated, and for the first time in months, perhaps even years, I went to work, knowing deep in my bones I would only ever worry about deadlines and client interactions that day forward, that my work-related fears which had seeped into my personal life over the years, would not be of the supernatural variety anymore. It's been years since then, and not once have I felt uneasy or watched. Sometimes, I still have dreams about a child walking by my side, trying to hold my hand, but withdrawing shyly at the last moment. But when I wake up after such dreams, I don't feel a sense of dread washing over me, only a pang of loneliness that ebbs away as the day drags on. I haven't been back to that bridge since, but I hope she's all right, whoever or whatever she was or is. It Ate Our Cows from Aberdeen I live on a small farm next to Glacier National Park, it's nothing expansive, just a little old place my grandparents built that my family continues to live on. We raise chickens here, some pigs too, and we used to have cows. That brings me to my strange story. There's a reason we don't have cows anymore. Something killed them. Back at the start of 2008, we had three cows named Jess, Sheila, and Marnie. We had planned to use them for milk, but they ended up mostly being big old pets that kept the grass short and clear of weeds. As spring started up that year, something strange began to happen. Back then, every night, I had to go outside right after dinner to make sure the cows were locked up in the barn. 
There are coyotes out here, and they've taken a chicken or two, and we didn't want to give them a chance at nipping at the cow's legs and causing permanent damage. I headed outside that night, beginning to pull Marnie inside the barn, then Jess. As I went out to retrieve Sheila, I heard this bizarre rumbling moan from the tree line, which set maybe 50 yards from the barn. I couldn't tell how deep in the woods the moan had come, but it didn't sound right. It wasn't like the scream or moan of a person or any animal I'd ever heard. It sounded so alien to me. It gave me goosebumps, and immediately I wanted to go back inside. But I knew my parents would be mad if I went inside without fetching Sheila first. I sighed, gritted my teeth, and walked towards the old girl. She was standing at the edge of the fence, maybe ten yards from the tree line, which was on the other side of that fence. The fact I had to walk closer to that forest to go get her really spooked me. The closer I walked to it, the more creeped out I got. I jogged over, just trying to get this over with. When I got to Sheila, I clicked the rope leash to her collar and tugged on her to get her to follow me. But she wouldn't budge. What's wrong with you? I said, and I tugged again. Still wouldn't budge, but she did let out a grunt. I'd never heard her do that before. I walked over and looked around her to make sure she hadn't hurt herself. When I checked her front legs, I nearly screamed. There was something wrapped around her leg. It shimmered in the moonlight as if it was covered in some thick slime, and it pulsated every other second. It was curled all the way up her leg, nearly to her ribs. I remember thinking, what in the world is that? My first thought was some kind of worm, snake, or leech had latched itself onto Sheila. First things first, I grabbed a stick to poke at it. I was not about to touch that thing with my bare finger. The moment I poked it, something crazy happened. In the blink of an eye, the thing slithered off of Sheila's leg and rapidly retracted in the direction of the forest. And I mean it when I say retracted. The thing was so long that this was only one end of it, and the other end seemed to still be in the nearby woods. I watched it pull away, pushing the grass to the side as it did, until this end of it disappeared into the tree line. Do snakes and worms and leeches slither backwards when running away? Surely not. This was something else, and I had no clue what that something else even was. I quickly pulled on Sheila, who now followed my lead with a bit of a limp. As we got closer to the light on the barn, I took a look at her leg. The fur and skin along her leg was all shredded up exactly where that creature had been latched onto her. I tied her to a post in the light and ran inside, fetching my mom and dad. My little brother came along too morbidly curious as to what was wrong with the cow. I pointed at Sheila's leg and explained, She was standing at the edge of the fence out there by the woods. I tried to bring her to the barn, but this long, worm-looking thing was wrapped on her leg. My dad was bewildered. My story sounded crazy, but the wound was there to prove it. A worm, huh? That big, that could do that to a cow. Not sure about that. I think maybe the poor girl got caught in some wire or bramble, got twisted on her leg. Dad, it was a living thing. I poked it with a stick and it yanked itself clean off. He raised up and scratched his head. Well, I trust you saw something on that poor thing. Never seen anything like it, to be honest. We bandaged up her leg and left her cozy in the barn, making sure to lock it up nice. Come morning before school, I ran outside to let the cows out, as was also my responsibility. I was worried about Sheila all night, and I wanted to see if she was doing any better. The moment I opened the front door and looked out at the barn, my heart sank. The barn doors were wide open. That couldn't be right. My dad was with me when we locked it up the night before. We couldn't have both been that absent-minded. I ran over to the barn doors and checked the locks. Sure enough, the chain was just dangling from the handle of the barn door on one side, and the padlock was on the ground, now open. I picked up the padlock. The moment I touched it, I was met with a slimy substance. Ew, I said. 
The padlock was busted. I couldn't get it to click back down. If I had to guess, it looked like someone had managed to literally yank the padlock open. But why was it so slimy? It wasn't long before I noticed the grass laid back in a wide trail leading up to the same edge of fence Sheila had been standing at the night before. No way, I said under my breath. I began to follow the trail before catching myself mid-step. First, I needed to check on Sheila. I turned on the lights inside the barn. Jess and Marnie were fine, but Sheila was gone. A trail of hay led up to the door as if she'd been dragged away, but there was no blood on the ground. Did a person do this? I followed the trail in the grass then, all the way up to the edge of the fence. I gasped when I saw it. The wooden fence had been broken in one spot, making room enough for something as big as Sheila to fit through. But near one of the posts was a leg. A cow's leg, with a smooth curling wound around it from top to bottom. I looked past the fence. The grass was laid back all the way to the woods. I ran to get my dad. I showed him what I'd found, and I heard him curse under his breath when he saw Sheila's leg near the fence. I was crying quietly then, knowing that we probably would not find Sheila alive. Dad sent me off to school in a hurry that day, telling me not to worry about it. As my mom, brother, and I drove away to school, I saw him head into the woods with a rifle and a flashlight. That day at school was slow and worrisome. I couldn't stop thinking about Sheila and my dad. I was beginning to think that that dang slimy thing had come back and dragged Sheila out of the barn. I mean, what else could explain that slimy lock? I just wanted to get home. That afternoon back at home, I found my dad at the kitchen table drinking a coffee. It was never a good sign to see my dad drinking an afternoon coffee. He always kept his coffee to the early morning to keep him awake. If he was drinking it late, it meant he wanted to be wide awake for some time, and it was already 4 p.m. Did you find her? I asked. Yep, I'll tell you, but don't tell your brother. Mom already knows. I nodded. She's dead, hun. Found her about half a mile into those woods. She got dragged pretty far by something before it ate up nearly half of her. I was sad, but I sort of knew that the news wouldn't be good. That's probably why my next question was an odd one. Was there some slimy stuff on her? He looked surprised at first, then he sighed. Sure was. I don't know what it was that got her, and it's best you don't think about it either. I ain't gonna let nothing get you or your brother or your mama. He tried to reassure me, but I wasn't feeling any better about the situation. In the matter of two weeks after that, Jess and Marnie would both be dragged away from the fields and into those very same woods the exact same way, each of them partially eaten when we found them. I was very upset about this, and we ended up putting a lot of time and energy into keeping the pigs and chickens we had safe too. But nothing ever came for them. Dad thinks whatever was out there moved on after eating the cows, but he was never too keen on getting more cows in case he was wrong. That was a long time ago, a very odd and very unsettling memory for me to dig up. I wish I knew what it was. I think that's the worst part, to have seen something that strange, that dangerous, and to never have confirmation of what it was, and yet I still live here. Seeing something eat my cows, I had nightmares for a while that my family might be next. I still have those nightmares on occasion. Maybe it's still out there somewhere. Maybe there's more of whatever it is. I've always thought that the slimy worm thing was just an appendage of a much larger creature. I guess I should be happy I never saw the rest of it. Transylvania Brigalici, from Opris Vlad. I live in Romania, more precisely, Cluj-Napoca City, 
widely known for the Untold Music Festival. As you may know, this region, Transylvania, is popular for vampire myths and legends. Today, however, I want to present a different kind of native creature that may roam freely in the dark. As a child, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. They were living in a village not far from my city. In the daytime, I was helping them at the farm, but the most exciting time for me was the nighttime story time. Because, after dark, my cousins and I would gather around Grandma. She had plenty of stories to share. Most of them were scary, though. Maybe she wanted to scare us to keep us from going outside at night. Who knows? Maybe out there, there are really some scary night creatures. Now, one story that remained in my mind and still sends chills down my spine is about a Pricolici. Some say that a Pricolici is a mix of a vampire and a werewolf, with a better resemblance of the latter. My grandma described him as a bipedal wolf, with glowing eyes and the capability to talk. Allow me to share with you her allegedly true story. This happened in my grandma's youth. She was at the village school, together with her best friend, Sava. They both had been punished for not doing their homework, so they had to kneel down on corn seeds and stay after school hours until their homework was done. Kneeling down in corn seeds is a very painful experience, but that was a long time ago. Honestly, I'm surprised there was even a school in the village at the time. Anyway, it was late November, so the sun was setting fast. After the two of them finished their work, they both decided to go home together to Sava's house and spend the night there. Sava's house was located at the border of the village. You had to pass through a small forest to get there. That night, it was nearly a full moon, and the wind was blowing gently with the smell of rotten meat. At a certain point, my grandma felt as if someone was watching them. Suddenly, they both heard this evil laugh from the trees above them. They panicked and clung to each other. From a tree branch, a humanoid black shape emerged from the dark. It had yellow glowing eyes, and its head resembled a rabid wolf. But the scariest part was its continuous evil laugh, as if the creature was mocking them and it knew they were going to die. What do you want? Leave us alone! My grandma screamed. I will devour your souls and bathe in your blood. The creature responded with a demonic voice. They started to run, the creature pursuing them closely, jumping from tree to tree. Its shadow was projected to the ground by the pale light of the moon, so my grandma knew when to avoid its grasp. Fortunately, they were not too far from the nearest house. They started knocking at the door when they arrived at it, begging for someone to open up. An old man and his wife let them inside. The beast continued to laugh at them, saying that it would devour their flesh. The woman prayed to the Lord with them, and the old man rubbed the doors and the windows with holy incense. He also put crosses at every door handle. That night, Nobody in the house could close their eyes to sleep. The old man told the girls that the creature was a Brigalici, an undead spirit that comes to torture the living. The following day, the old man went to church, and together with the village's priest, they formed a mob. They had torches and sickles. One of them told the rest that the creature was hiding during the day in an abandoned barn. Once they got there, the beast was sleeping in the hay. There was a smell of rotten meat and animal bones. A village man poked the belly of the creature, and it screamed out in pain. It soon found it was vastly outnumbered. He cursed them all and promised it would be back for revenge one day. With a strong jump, it broke the barn roof and disappeared. Ever since then, no one has ever seen anything suspicious not even the people from the nearby villages. I was thinking about this particular story because I'm back in my grandparents' village, walking in the cemetery near the woods. I brought some flowers to show respect for my grandma's tombstone, and I tried to remember all the good moments we spent together. 
and suddenly, out of nowhere, I smelled the scent of death nearby, and I swear I heard this evil laughter. Something imitating our cows in the fields. From Anonymous. I was at my grandfather's farm, which is on Native American land in Wisconsin. My dad had made jokes about the farm being an old Indian burial ground, which now I kind of believe. This supernatural thing I encountered that night heavily unsettled me, as now I know that past experiences my dad and uncle had with supposed wendigos and skinwalkers might be true. Now, on to what happened. I had just finished up shuffling corn silage into our blower, heading up to my dad's old square body truck to drive over to mine to work on it. I drove over there and got the treble light out, plugged it in and popped the hood on my truck. I just hung the treble light on my hood when I heard the cows bellowing. Now, I would have shaken this off as normal, but it was coming from the direction of our fields. I drove my dad's truck down to the barn to tell him. He then told me to go check the gates to see if the cows had ripped them down. But the gates were still up. I had the truck running with the lights on, and I shut it off. The same bellowing noises came from the fields, only now more distorted. Like it wasn't coming from cattle, it was coming from something trying to imitate the cows. It was too high pitch and almost sounded like it was crackling. I went ahead and drove my dad's truck back up to my truck. I put the light away and closed up the big steel shed my truck was next to. All the while, the sounds of those quote-unquote cows got more distorted, like some sort of unnatural animal both breathing and screaming very loudly. The bellows were happening in quick succession. This wasn't normal. Our cows never sounded like that. I was walking back to my dad's truck when I heard possibly the most unsettling sounds in about five seconds. From two different directions came two loud screams, not ear-piercing, but still plenty loud. Then, from the same direction that the cow sounds had come from, I heard coyotes howling. I bolted to the truck and hit the gas, not wanting to find out what could mimic cows and coyotes. I told my dad about it, and he asked what it was. I just told him I would tell him in the truck. Then he did what I didn't want him to do. He began to say, oh, skinwalker, a skinwalker. I yelled at him not to say its name. Eventually, we went back to the shed. Our farm yard isn't too big. From the shed where my truck is to the barn can't be more than 25 yards. But eventually, we went back up there with my grandpa's truck. Once there, my dad swapped the receiver hitch so we could hook it up to a kick bail wagon that my grandpa was going to bring back to our neighbors in the morning. I didn't want to be there much longer, so this didn't make anything at all better. Now, what makes everything about this story worse is that we have these stereotypical tall cornfields. It's good for business this year. They're probably 12 feet high in some places, but I hate the fact that something could be hiding in there so easily. I'm sorry if the writing was sloppy, but I'm really shaken up by this, and I'm probably not in the right headspace. If I encounter anything more regarding this, I'll let you know. Now, if you're still wondering about what my dad and uncle might have seen, I can tell you here. The story goes that it was the early 2000s. My dad and his older brother were out cutting firewood around late fall or early winter. It would get dark around that time, around 4.30 p.m., my uncle alerted my dad to something chasing deer across the field and on a hill. Whatever it was, it was gaining on the deer, and according to my dad, it looked half wolf and half ape. So yeah, that's that. Not sure if that would be a wendigo or a skinwalker. The worst part about all this is that the cows were up near our cow yard, which was near the fields, and to me it seemed like something was out there trying to communicate with them trying to lure one or more away. Our cows aren't allowed out in our fields either, so this really scared me. And while riding this, I just heard breathing through my AC in my room. So, yeah, maybe I'll just go cry now. Flesh Pedestrian Sighting in Northwest USA From K. Salami 
I think we all fell into weird research phases during quarantine. I know I did. I had such boredom I began to research Native American folklore. I've always had a vast appreciation for Native American culture and a large obsession with cryptids and horror. My boyfriend is Native American. He's taught me a lot about his culture, but I wanted to learn more about their horror stories. I stumbled upon one of the most common cryptids in Native American folklore, the Flesh Pedestrian. Some of you may not be familiar with this particular title for the creature. I suggest looking it up, but don't think too hard and long about it, and don't say its name out loud. This is what I was taught by my boyfriend. He also advised me not to look too deep into their history and to avoid obsessive reading about this specific creature. That didn't work. I couldn't stop listening to stories about it, reading about their origins, what makes them who rather than what they are. Either way, the story I came here to tell begins at night. I had been lying in bed reading r slash no sleep when my boyfriend texted me. He asked if I wanted to go over to his brother's house. I responded, sure, why not? He and his friend drove back into town from the rural farmhouse to pick me up and grab a pizza for us. We laughed and joked on our way back to the farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Eventually, we made it to the road his brother lived on. We made the right-hand turn and the headlights drifted over the darkened cornfield illuminating it. But in the middle of the field stood a tall, pale figure hunched over its back to us. My heart sank. My boyfriend and I instantly knew what had found us. However, our friend did not. He began to exclaim at the sight of the being, Holy crap! Did you guys see that? Why aren't you reacting to that thing? At which point I told him very quickly and in a stern voice, Listen, that thing you just saw, you've got to stop thinking about it, talking about it, and don't go looking for it in that field. We're to act like nothing happened. We're going into the barn, closing the door, eating and working on the truck. The barn doors are to stay closed, and we only open them if we know who's on the other side. He looked at me as though I had just spun my head backwards like the exorcist. What the heck are you even talking about? What's the big deal? He asked. All I could say to that was, please just listen to me and trust me on this. After the ground rules were laid down, the rest of the night goes on and we almost forget about what happened. Almost. A while later, after a couple of beers, I needed to use the restroom and I wasn't too keen on doing it outside. So I asked my boyfriend to accompany me into the empty farmhouse so I could use the facilities. His brother was at work at the time and his brother's dog was at his grandparents' house about 20 minutes away. We walk up to the dark, silent house without incident. Quickly, I use the bathroom. When I was done, my boyfriend raided the fridge for anything worth eating. I wandered the empty, quiet bachelor pad. I looked through the kitchen window, and I noticed a light bouncing around behind the barn about ten yards into the farm field. Who or what the heck was out there? I freaked out, calling my friend who had been left in the barn. I see the light move up to his head as he answers the phone. He was out there with his phone light on, looking around. I demanded to know what the heck he was doing considering the strict list of rules I'd given him after the incident in the car. Yeah, I know, but I swear I could have seen Ripley in the field. Ripley is the name of my boyfriend's brother's dog that wasn't supposed to be home. The dog was most assuredly with her grandparents 20 minutes away from home. All of this was known by the friend. In complete awe, I told him to head back to the barn. We then met at the entrance and walked back in together. I asked what the heck he was doing. He explained. I went outside to use the bathroom, and as I was doing so, I saw something moving around in the field. I couldn't help but think it was Ripley, and I felt the need to go after her and get her. But after you called, it was like I snapped out of a trance, realizing Ripley wasn't here. But I already knew that before I even went to the bathroom. It was so strange. At this point, my boyfriend and I are darn near in hysterics. We peeled out of the driveway so darn fast. As we left, I told our friend to just forget about what happened 
and to not bring it up again tonight. When we were gone and safe, I eventually explained to him that I think he had been lured out to the field by a flesh pedestrian, which had intended to separate him from us using the illusion of the dog our friend was familiar with. Our friend, if he had gotten far enough away from us, it would have attacked him. Our friend thought I was completely insane. However, this still chills me to the bone. I knew the consequences of researching these creatures. I'd been reading and listening to stories of those who had been in the presence of them for days at that point. I can confidently say that nothing good can come of it. Beware of these creatures, for if I hadn't educated myself, I'm sure my friend could have been prey that night. Our next story today is an update to a previous story from almost a year ago, so to make sure everything makes sense, I'm going to go ahead and add the original story here. Then after that, I'll go ahead and read the update. Enjoy. Hayfield Stalker From Crepuscular Creature It was around the beginning of October of 2020 when I first saw it. I was sitting outside with the cats. I live on a small farm in West Michigan, and my uncle had planted a new hayfield that summer. We'd seen plenty of coyote, a bobcat or two, and even a few cougars, but nothing like this. As I was sitting outside with the cats, my eyes wandered to the cows in the pasture, who were acting strange. They were huddled in a protective circle with the younger ones in the middle, as if they sensed a danger or a storm coming. I was about to go in the house and tell my grandma, but that's when I saw it. This creature was stalking across the new hayfield. Its body and stride reminded me of a coyote, but it had an oddly long tail and small big cat-like ears. I was confused by the build of it, but what confused me more was the coloration. This creature was pure black. I instantly thought it was melanistic, which is basically the opposite of albinism. The animal stalked to one end of the hayfield before turning and walking back to the other, disappearing in the tall grass before reappearing a short time later and doing the same thing over and over again. It just continued to pace as I watched it, adding to the confusion of it all. Now I did find an odd paw print in the driveway, which leads to the new hayfield near the beginning of spring. It looked like a cougar paw print, but the shape was off and the claws were visible and looked similar to a canine's. This paw print showed qualities of a feline and canine, which was very confusing since a crossbreed between the two was impossible. When the creature didn't reappear after heading into the tall grass at the side of the field for the final time, I went inside and told my grandma, who didn't think much of it unless it was posing a threat to us or our animals. I saw the creature pacing back and forth every few nights. It happened so often the cows got used to it, and no longer huddled together. I think my grandma saw it one night, because I wasn't allowed to go outside at night anymore, which bummed me out. I did try and get a picture of it one night, but my phone camera doesn't zoom in that much, and all the pictures were blurry, causing the creature to look like a blurry black dot against a chaotic green background. I'm unsure of what it is still, but I'm not willing to go out there and find out. Thunderbird in Oklahoma Farmland From Anonymous I am a resident of southern Oklahoma, and I live far out in the countryside where farmland is most of all there is around. I have lived here from when I was ten, when my parents moved from the big city life of New York out to the Great Plains for a drastic change of scenery. Since the move, they've been happier and generally more agreeable in all aspects of life, Sometimes the hustle of the city isn't for everyone. For those who don't know, Oklahoma is a very hot and dry place for most of the year. It can get brutally cold in the winter, and the rains are few and far between. On the rare occasion that a storm does roll in, they're quite something to behold. The landscape being mostly flat and far-reaching lends to being able to see massive storms slithering in across the sky. Claps of thunder rumble the pebbles on the gravel road, and bolts of lightning that are like fireworks on a blank canvas. Ever since I can remember, this has been my favorite kind of weather, until one day that I will never forget. 
my younger brother Sam and I were taking a weekend hike in southeastern Oklahoma, where the region is most forested, around the Washita Mountains area if you're familiar with that location. We're both big fans of the outdoors, taking advantage of the beauty that nature has to offer. The Americas have such a vast amount of deferring ecosystems within them, and we enjoy exploring them all at our leisure. At the time, I was 29, my brother was 21 years old, and while the age gap between us was large, we still managed to get along just fine. We weren't without our arguments on our previous trips, but these tend to level out as we both aged. The outdoors have always bonded our family, and we all seem to relax more once we actually get out on the trails. It's almost like taking a solo trip, but just having another body with you in case something goes wrong. This area of southeast Oklahoma is more heavily forested, full of hilly areas that eventually became the Washita Mountains. This region gets much more rain and is packed with lush foliage. It also has more elaborate wildlife than we're used to out in the plains. Pine and oak trees are the most populous in this area, and when they grow undisturbed, they get huge and are magnificent in all their glory. All of this being a welcomed change from the flat prairie. We felt like being in a different world while we drove out east into the woods. After a late start from our B&B, Sam and I were making our way up the rear end of one of the vistas where we had planned to camp overnight. We'd imagined a stunning view would be waiting for us at the top. However, we were beginning to lose daylight, and we could feel the winds beginning to change. The breeze was always a welcome relief, but it grew stronger and stronger as we neared the top of the hill. As the wind blew, I could begin to smell the air changing to that recognizable scent and that texture you feel before a storm is about to happen. This paired with the clouds that became darker and more threatening was a sure sign that we were running out of time. Looks like rain, I said to Sam, who was walking ahead of me. You've got to be kidding me, he turned and said with a sigh. I shrugged my shoulders at him in an effort to sympathize with his frustration. We're almost at the top of the ridge, and we still have to set up our tent before it pours. He spoke again, resting his back against one of the oak trees. I know, I spoke again. The weather looked completely clear for the day. Maybe this will pass us by, but we should at least pick up our pace if we want to get a good view. Our hiking relationship has always worked quite well. Sam's always been in charge of navigation and timekeeping, and I was more the practical type. I always did my research on the region for what kinds of things were edible, what the conditions were like, and generally reading the signs that nature was giving in the moment. After my encouragement, Sam nodded and we pressed on to climb the ridge. With every passing moment, the clouds became darker and the air became heavier. I knew we didn't have much time before we got soaked, so I started taking even bigger strides, walking with my weight held forward in an effort to quicken our pace. We would normally take a break by this point, but we wasted no time in trying to reach the top, while our backpacks grew heavier with each step we took. Finally, after what seemed like days of speed walking, we began to see more sky opening up on the horizon as we came up on the vista. The view was literally breathtaking as we both gasped for air that the atmosphere tried to squeeze from us. The clouds above were enormous and full of water, which threatened to drop on us at any moment. We were able to see the tops of other hills and the lowest points in the valleys, just like something from a storybook. Filled with exhilaration and excitement, I neared closer to the edge trying to look farther down the mountainside. Suddenly, a strong gust of wind blew me over. I fell to the ground in an effort to stay away from the edge of the cliff. As I felt powerless and scared, my brother laughed at me. My expression was one of shock while I sat on the ground. As if it were a climax to our hard trek, a thick bolt of lightning shot out from the clouds, followed by a roll of thunder that rattled in our chests. We looked at each other, knowing what had to come next. Without a word, we went to work on setting up our tent and pulling out our equipment from the backpacks. The wind was whipping through the trees now, and we could hear the birds making their last songs as the storm rolled in. With the tent taking shape and pulling out various parts from my backpack, I gave another look outward from the cliffside to the skies, which were presenting a gorgeous picture of nature's power embodied by the storm. The sun was beginning to set, 
and the storm dragging across the sky turned the world into a beautiful stone gray mixed with deep red and burgundy tones, like chalk on a brick wall. Out from the clouds, my eyes focused on a shape that emerged on the wind of the storm. Illuminated by the intermittent flashes of lightning, the shape of a bird became clear as it rode the waves of the sky. If you've ever seen a large bird in flight, you know how they can give the illusion of not moving while they beat their wings and stay afloat in the sky. Their mass makes them seem motionless, and while they can move a great distance, they appear to be stationary in midair. That was not the case for this bird. I watched the jet black bird weave its way through the sky, turning and diving in and out of the huge cloud formations, disappearing from view for a moment and then coming back into my line of sight. It seemed to glide across the sky with the speed of a torpedo and the grace of an angel, beating its wings and falling through the covers of the storm. It demonstrated its prowess with ease. It managed all kinds of epic maneuvers, as if it were performing for me. My eyes darted back and forth across the stage as it danced before me, captivating its audience and holding strong against the whipping winds. Admiring this bird and its freeness in the sky, I watched with awe as it made its last rounds about the kingdom of the sky and disappeared behind a thick cloud just as a bolt of lightning came crashing down. I was speechless. I felt humbled by such a creature. I've never seen a bird move like that on any previous hike or even in the wildest nature documentaries. Its movements seemed to have had no purpose, none that I could seem to understand. I thought about what exactly it was doing or where it was going. My thoughts instantly went to some of the best boxers or wrestlers' movements and how they move about their surroundings in an effort to recharge their energy for their performance. Having no frame of reference other than clouds, I had no idea to the true size of the bird, and with how fast it was moving, I figured it wasn't very big. Hey, you gonna help finish or what? Sam said, drawing me out of my trance. I'd stopped setting up and being totally transfixed by the bird, I'd paused in mid-zipper opening of the tent's front entrance. We finished the last steps and staked the tent into the ground as the wind was blowing quite fiercely now. The thunder calmly rumbled as it neared our camp. We were sitting outside the door, watching the last flecks of light sink below the horizon. No stars could be seen as the veil of the storm covered the night sky, the occasional lightning strike giving us our view of the surroundings as darkness set in. I watched with bated breath, hoping for the return of the black bird to give me another performance, but it never circled back a second time. Not long after dark, the raindrops could be heard on the roof of our tent as Sam and I munched on granola bars. The heavy atmosphere lifting and the air getting easier to stomach with each breath we soon relaxed while the storm gave way to our security of the night. There's something naturally human about the rain putting us to sleep, either the white noise or the rumbling of thunder. The sleep you get camping in a rainstorm is the best sleep you can get anywhere, in my opinion. The light from our battery-powered lamps and the lightning strikes overhead allowed us to see with limited range within the tent. Quieting down, we listened to the rain while we wrapped up in our sleeping bags and began to drift off to sleep. At some point during the night, raindrops still pattering above, I felt this feeling crawl up from my stomach, that nagging sensation from my psyche, that something is watching me. My eyes opened wide from a dead sleep, and I quickly took note of my surroundings. The tent lamps had powered off, Sam was sound asleep a few feet away from me. The lightning struck all around us furiously, but was met with no thunder crashes to match them. This tense feeling littered the air as she could hear the sizzle of electricity slicing through the night. The shadows of the trees surrounding us were like sleeping giants, moving and bending in the wake of the wind like they were taking deep breaths. It felt as if the majestic scenery from earlier had turned into something more sinister with the arrival of the storm. I'm not afraid of the dark. I never have been. I am afraid of getting caught unaware and being the last to know about something dangerous. In an effort to prove this to myself, I sat up in the tent and took the sleeping bag off my body. Trying to find the source of this familiar feeling, I moved closer to the opening of the tent, which was now zipped up tight. We'd positioned the tent with the opening facing the edge of the cliff, so that we'd be met with a stunning view in the morning. 
As I unzipped the tent's door, I was met with an equally bewildering sight. The cold night air hit my face. Raindrops cascaded down the door of the tent as I peered out into the stormy night. Fierce wind blew falling rain into my eyes, obscuring my view somewhat. Lightning scattered across the sky. The sky was black, apart from the cloudy forms that were illuminated by the lightning bolts. These fleeting moments of light revealed to me an enormous shape darting across the sky. At first, I thought it was a weather balloon or someone's tent blowing around in the sky, but as I watched on while the storm illuminated the shape, it became clear to me this was no inanimate object adrift in the sky. My heart became a pit in my stomach as I soon made out the object. The way it moved was planned, predatory, and primal. The sound of beating massive wings echoed upon the wind. I began to make out the shape better, and I noticed it was moving closer and closer to the ridge we camped on. Then I realized its features were all too familiar. Feathers as dark as the night, even though they shimmered in the rain, massive curled talons were tucked underneath its torpedo-like body, a head like that of a sickly crow, its hooked beak like that of a vulture. It moved with calculated efforts, harnessing the power of the storm, riding the wind like a surfer on a tidal wave. Making one final swoop into the sky, the creature released a screeching bellow, triggering a massive thunderclap and echoing through the night. I found myself in a horrible state of paralysis. This encounter shook me to the very fibers of my being. Behind me, Sam awoke with a gasp. He sat straight up in the tent. He soon scrambled over to the opening as well and caught sight of the avian giant. Not a word was shared between us as we looked out into the night. The Thunderbird was even closer now, circling our tent like a falcon stalks a mouse. It began to dive down to the ridge then, while it tucked its wings close to its body. It felt as if time slowed down. Its head rose, the Thunderbird's body becoming horizontal in midair, talons exposed like powerful meat hooks. Its wings stretched out like a crucifix, head aimed straight at our tent. Sam broke from his trance, grabbing the back of my shirt collar and pulling me away from the tent door, using his whole body weight to move me. I fell back to the rear of the tent as the shape of the bird began to fill the view of the door. With a sickening sound of tearing cloth, the entrance of the tent began to lift off the ground. The solid bottom of our enclosure became loose, the stakes popping out of the wet ground. The world shifted as we felt gravity sidestep us, above becoming where below should have been. We fell on top of each other in the side of the tent. We were airborne. Feeling utterly powerless, we screamed, only to be met by more furious giant wing flaps and content grunting of the Thunderbird. I caught a glimpse of Sam's eyes and I saw something I'll never forget. The unmistakable look of defeat, sadness, fear. I'm sure the same was reflected in my own expression. Suddenly, our airborne tent was met with a crash to the side. We'd smacked against something mid-flight. Sam and I were tussled about even more in the moving sack as our rough flight was made even more rough. Another horrible screech was heard from the Thunderbird at a deafening volume. Then from afar, a similar screech rang out through the air. Another of the creatures. The wall of the tent was like a shadow puppet show. These shadows revealed not one, but two massive flying birds. Violent screeches and shrieks surrounded us. Suddenly, claws ripped into the tent, and with that, we could feel ourselves plummeting, our weight shifting from our stomachs to our throats, like an elevator dropping down too fast. Sam and I screamed. We could feel the tent scraping against tree branches now. With one final strike, our tent collided with the low-hanging branch of a tree, and our party came to a grinding halt. The sounds of thunder became distant. The birds above continued on through the air. We screamed again, this time in pain as the branches poked through the tent. They had ripped cloth and flesh. The two of us then fell through the tent. We collided with more branches before finally landing on the wet ground and mud. Sam lay a few feet from me and I reached out my hand to grab his. Breathing heavy, we turned to see what had become of the two birds. 
They soared through the sky and with every contact against each other, they clawed and speared one another. Their forms began to blur together as my eyes became heavy. The Thunderbird's calls rattled in my head along with the raging rolls of thunder, but both became more faint as they flew farther into the night and as I drifted away. When I woke up, I was in a hospital. Bright lights burned my eyes. I felt a searing pain course through my ribs as I took each breath, a strong throbbing in my head. I looked down, seeing tubes and hoses going into me. There was a remote near my hand, so I pushed the biggest button on it. Nurses soon came to my room. After a lengthy conversation with them, they explained that Sam and I were found at the base of a tree covered in mud. Someone driving on the main road farther down the mountain found pieces of our tent strewn about the trees. They eventually came upon us. They then called the police and paramedics. We'd been carried five miles downhill from our original campsite by severe storm conditions. I began to spout ravings about thunderbirds, telling the nurse about the storm, the flight, and the drop. I received only looks of confusion and laughter. They told me, while I shared the same story as my brother, we both suffered injuries from the wind blowing our tent into the tree, that we were both delusional due to our shaken mental state. I'd never been so angry in all my life, treated like some child who was afraid of the dark. I'd almost died because of a real massive bird of prey that can pick two fully grown men out of a bolted down tent and carry them for miles in a thunderstorm. I mean, there was not just one of these creatures, but two, maybe more out there. Thankfully, I only suffered a large gash to the head and some bruised ribs. Sam had a dislocated shoulder and sprained ankle. We were beaten, but alive. This did stop us from camping together for nearly six years, until after the birth of my first child. These days, we're both older, both with kids. We don't rant and rave about the night we nearly died. It just remains a bedtime story for our sons and daughters to tell on rainy nights. We take family camping trips together, but no place so remote and wild as we did in our youth. A warning to those going camping in the Americas. Mother Nature is beautiful, stunning, and breathtakingly gorgeous. She's also deadly, mysterious, and secretive. There are things we still don't know about our own planet and the creatures that live here, so it's always best to treat your surroundings with respect. I won't discourage the exploration and enjoyment of the wilderness, but I will caution you. Take every precaution and preparation you can when going into new territory, and always take a second person with you. Had it not been for Sam that night, I don't know that I would have been here to recount the story. Be wary of camping in the Washita Mountains of Oklahoma, especially when a storm is beginning to brew. I still don't know. From Running 8.3 This took place in the middle of farm country in New York. Most people hear New York and immediately think NYC, not even close. There's a huge state above New York City, full of woods, farms, and tiny towns. It's actually very beautiful, just very expensive to live here. And with no jobs in those small towns, you can only guess the poverty levels. Anyway, I'm getting off track. I'm a lover of all things spooky, but I am a skeptic, or I was. I'm still on the fence. The night in question was a very warm, humid night. The sky was slightly cloud-covered, and the fire I'd made was flickering nicely. This was the first time I'd had any time to myself in a few months, as I'm a mom of three awesome kids who are now all grown. I lived in town and had neighbors on either side of me and out back of me, but there were some small trees and brush separating the back and fences on either side of us. I was sitting by myself drinking a few beers and definitely had a buzz going on, but I was aware of my surroundings still. I heard a weird noise coming from the side of one of the neighbor's yards, and I figured it was my neighbor just checking in on me. I sat there waiting to hear his voice. It was around 1 a.m., and it wasn't unusual for him to be awake. I waited for a moment and heard nothing, so I figured it was just the beer talking. I decided that was probably enough, and I should let the fire die out and go inside. The moment I stood up, I heard a low growl. What in the world? I thought. 
All my dogs were inside, and the neighbors didn't have dogs anymore, as they had to put their dog down a week earlier. I called out to my dogs, and all three showed up at the glass door inside, so it couldn't have been them. Then it grew louder, an aggressive growl, a warning. My eyes darted around to find nothing. I grew up around wildlife, and regardless of what people will tell you, there are wolves in New York. So that did cross my mind. Maybe that or a coyote. They can be pretty common in the area. Also black bears, but no way that noise was a bear. I grabbed the flashlight, and I heard the growl once more. Only this time it sounded like it said, Don't. By then, I'm a little scared. But then I think it's just my imagination, and I need to go inside. I grabbed the bucket of water and dumped it around the fire, then onto it. That's when I spotted it. A large figure standing at the fence. A very large figure. I almost threw up from fear and from the smell. There was an aroma coming from it, like rotten garbage. I was terrified, but acted like I hadn't seen it. Whatever it was had to have been at least seven feet tall, and it looked to have fur covering its body. Its growl was so menacing. I walked towards my house, and I could hear it following me. I got inside, locking the doors and grabbing a knife. My dogs were now sniffing vigorously and growling themselves. They love everyone and are never aggressive, so this was odd behavior. My doorknob on my door started to rattle, and my dogs went crazy. I yelled and ran for the living room. Heart of a lion, I have. That was the last thing I heard that night, so the dogs must have scared whoever or whatever it was away. Still, I stayed up the rest of the night. I finally did fall asleep at daylight. I have no idea if it was someone messing with me or something else, but I never did do the alone around a fire thing ever again while I lived there. Warning, the following story contains depictions of violence against animals. Dogman or Werewolf in Ohio From Anonymous I was 22 when this happened. For the past five or six years, I've only had two friends who have stuck with me through everything. We live within five minutes of each other, in a rural area in southwest Ohio, specifically in the hills of the Ohio River Valley. For anonymity's sake, I'll be G. My two friends are W and A, and my brother will be R. A and R are next door neighbors. They both live on decently sized plots of land that they don't actually own. There's lots of farmland and thick forest. Behind W's house is a couple of small ponds we used to fish in. His house was pretty small and not in the best condition, and A lived in a medium sized brick house. We'd usually go to W's house to hang out during the summer, since his parents were always at camp, and A's house or my house during the other seasons. This is somewhat relevant, but mostly for setup. Now, we all love guns, so when A called and told me he bought a new AR-15, I knew we were going to end up shooting before the day was over. I grabbed my SKS paratrooper carbine and Glock 19, and R grabbed his AK-47 and his SIG P-230, we got in my jeep and drove to A's house. It was still early, about three in the afternoon. Less than five minutes after we pulled in, a black Chevy Impala pulled into the driveway, heralding W's arrival. He brought his AR-15 and a Beretta M9. We shot for a couple of hours, just taking pot shots at a wooden target A had built in his backyard. We ended up burning through a pretty big chunk of ammo. At that point, I decided I wanted to get something to drink. So I got into my Jeep and drove about 10 minutes away to the closest gas station. After getting to the station and getting a few cans of the Nectar of the Gods, by which I of course mean Monster, I headed back to A's house. When I came back, I saw W, A, and R standing by the door at the side of the house. A had a look of unease on his face. I exited the Jeep and walked over, asking what was going on. We heard some weird sounds in the woods a few minutes ago, W told me. 
I asked him what exactly he was talking about and what he meant by weird sounds. A began to explain. We heard some sort of loud vocalization that sounded like a mix between a coyote's yelping and a howl. None of us had any idea what it could have been, so we decided to forget about it. We went inside and played some games. After a few hours, I was bored and began browsing 4chan on my phone, and I lost track of time. But it was getting pretty late. W had walked outside to smoke a cigarette. A was in the bathroom, and R's girlfriend came and picked him up. Then A's dogs began to bark all of a sudden. This startled me. That's when I heard W come back inside the house rather quickly. I asked what was going on, and if something was wrong. Step outside. Check for yourself, he told me. I stepped outside, curious about what the dogs were barking at, and the second I opened the door, the smell hit me. It was the worst smell I've ever smelled in my entire life. Imagine the scent of a wet dog, the reek of a dead deer rotting in the sun, and the smell of a landfill. Combine those together, and you've got what I can best describe it as. Repulsed by the smell, I went back inside, telling W I can see why he came in so quickly. The dogs were still barking, and they seemed to be getting more aggressive. A finally came out of the bathroom, wondering what the commotion was about. W explained the smell, and A seemed more curious than anything. He was also angry about the prospect of someone trespassing. He grabbed his guns and walked outside to look around. He told us to stay inside until he got back. Not thinking much of it, I began to browse more of 4chan. I was startled when I heard the sound of a dog yelping, followed by five gunshots in rapid succession. A couple of minutes later, A busted through the door, yelling, Get your guns! He said in a panicked voice. Some dude in a ghillie suit just killed one of the dogs! We grabbed our guns and followed him outside, staying close the entire time. Sure enough, in the backyard, we found one of the dogs, dead. His throat had been torn up. This wasn't a small dog, either. It was a rather large poodle mix of some kind, and I mean one of the really big ones. Close by, we saw the other dog cowering in his house. The cows in the pasture on the other side of the road were mooing as if they were both afraid and agitated. I asked A to explain what was going on, and he told me, I was on the other side of the barn when I heard the dog yelping. When I rounded the corner, I saw this figure that looked like a big guy in a ghillie suit running towards the woods. I shot at him, hoping to hit his leg and incapacitate him or something, but I know I didn't hit him. The same smell I described earlier was still hanging in the air, but it was faint. W and A had flashlights on their rifles, and I had one on my pistol. I slung my SKS over my back and drew my pistol, and we fanned out, looking around the area. I wasn't expecting to find anything. I could see W heading to the other edge of the property, and A was moving towards the cow pasture. I headed back towards the barn, and as I started to step in, I lit a cigarette. I felt raindrops starting to hit me, so I stepped under the barn to smoke. I stood there for less than a minute when I heard another gunshot. This one came from the direction W had gone in. I began to walk that way, and I saw A heading that way too. While we were making our way over, W fired off three more shots. What the heck are you shooting at? A asked. I saw that dude, but W's voice was shaky and hushed. It didn't look like a guy. W took a heavy gulp and continued to explain. It looked like a big dog or a wolf. I could clearly see its muscle and ears. I just saw it standing behind some bushes, but it had to have been standing on two legs. He stopped and pulled out a cigarette, his hand shaking but still managing to light the thing. I sized it up using a nearby tree and it had to have been over six feet, at least. What are you even talking about? A asked. I chimed in. You know there aren't any wolves nearby, and coyotes don't get that big, 
You think a coyote would have the guts to come up and rip my dog's throat out? We've got to be dealing with some pelt-wearing hermit strung out on something. The tree that W was talking about was about 350 feet away, so we all walked over to check it out. The rain started to pick up, and the wind was getting strong as well. The clap of thunder put us all on edge. Sure enough, once we reached the tree, a large maple, the branch he used to determine the size was close to eight feet off the ground by our estimate. We decided to put the other dog into the garage to keep it safe from whoever or whatever was messing with us. This dog was inside a small kennel, but if you live in a rural area, you know a junkie always finds a way to break into places they aren't wanted. A unlocked the kennel. The dog followed A to the garage and went inside. Then A locked the door and we ran back inside the house. So, uh, should we just leave? We can just crash at G's house until morning, W said. I reminded him that R and his girlfriend were there. His face instantly shifted to that of disgust. We all hated R's girlfriend because she wasn't very nice. None of us wanted to deal with her at the time, so we unanimously decided to just hunker down with our guns and stay awake in shifts. It was past midnight at that point, and I volunteered to take the first shift, from midnight to 2 a.m. W and A soon passed out, and I sat there watching out the window. I became bored after a while, my adrenaline from earlier wearing off. I reached into my backpack and pulled out a finely crafted Gurkha cigar. I stepped out onto the back porch, lit my stogie, and began to smoke and unwind. I had been standing there for about ten minutes when I heard the cows beginning to make a lot of noise again, and I could hear the other dog barking aggressively inside the garage. Once more, I was on edge. I set my cigar in the ashtray, and I unslung my rifle, holding it with the safety off. I made sure not to stray too far off out of the porch light, but I got far enough into the field to see movement in the tree line. I couldn't see what it was, but in a gap in the trees and undergrowth, I saw a quick flash of a gray figure. I began feeling very uneasy, so I started backing into the house. I could hear rustling over the breeze. It sounded like it was moving towards me. I pointed my rifle in that direction. If you aren't familiar with guns, a typical SKS has a 10-round fixed magazine. That means I would have 10 shots to defend myself before I'd have to reach for my pistol if something were to happen. But then, the rustling stopped. I still couldn't see anything. I was about halfway between the porch and tree line. Time felt as if it had stopped, and I felt as if I'd been standing there for hours. I turned and ran, hearing something burst from the undergrowth behind me. I reached the back door and threw the door open, struggling to catch my breath, likely due to years of smoking. W and A had awakened, and W shift started soon. I told them about what happened, and they told me to go lie down for a bit, that when I woke up we could all sit up until sunrise. So I lay down on the couch, managing to somehow doze off. I woke up not long after by W shaking me. We have to go now, he said in a panicked tone. A went outside over half an hour ago, and he hasn't come back yet. I was still half asleep, so it took me a moment to let that sink in. A is gone? I asked, trying to make sense of what I was hearing. I sat up, asking W to explain things. We heard the cows outside acting agitated again, but then they started to sound like they were afraid. Then some of them managed to trample through the fence. A went to see what scared them and told me if he wasn't back in ten minutes to call the cops. By then, I was lacing up my boots. To heck with that, W began to say. A's our brother. We can't just leave him out there. We're going to go out there and find him. I agreed without hesitation. We grabbed guns, my backpack full of extra ammo, and W grabbed a machete. We walked out the door and locked it behind us. I could see the spot in the fence where the cows had broken through. We crossed the road and walked into the pasture. This pasture is huge, 
Part of it is just grass. It also has a small pond, but most of it is forest, flat forest, the kind with not much undergrowth and where the trees are spaced out more. A great place for cattle and a great place to hunt as well. If I had to guess, I would say it was at least 200 acres. W used to hunt on this farmer's land as well. He was leading the way when we heard a long string of rapid gunshots, followed by a short pause, then nine more shots. It was clearly A emptying his rifle, grabbing his pistol, and emptying it as well. We sprinted in that direction, even though it sounded far off. We reached the wooden part of the property and started to call for A. We kept making our way in the direction we heard the shots. Panic began to set in with each passing moment. W was losing his cool, and I wasn't far behind. Then W just took off, sprinting. He yelled, There he is! That's gotta be him! I gave chase, but I was having trouble keeping up. Yo, slow down! I yelled, trying to get W to listen to me. We need to stick together here! But he didn't listen. His light was bobbing back and forth as he ran, and I continued to follow. I slipped in a mud puddle at one point. At least, I hoped it was just mud, and I ate the ground. I looked up and started trying to regain my bearings. But when I did, I saw this silhouette standing about 50 feet away. It looked like a big German Shepherd-type dog standing on its back legs. Its ears were up, and I could see its muzzle as it was looking in a different direction. I looked down, and I saw that it didn't have typical front legs. Instead, it had what looked to be arms with hands and fingers, tipped with claws. It seemed to be covered in gray, matted fur. But what stood out the most to me were the piercing yellow eyes. I saw it take off running in the direction W was going. I stood up as quickly as I could, giving chase in the same direction. If W was in danger, I had to do something to try to help. I ran and ran, starting to hear more gunshots, and eventually I saw W's light in the distance. He stopped shooting, and I saw the light pointing at the ground like he was reloading. I caught up and asked him if he saw it. I looked over and noticed A was on the ground, his back against a tree. I started to panic, asking if he was okay. He's breathing, just unconscious, W explained. We've got to get him home. We both picked him up and slung one arm around our shoulders. We began to make our way back to the house, but we knew we were being watched, and even worse, followed. We could hear it moving when we moved, stopping when we stopped. I drew my pistol with my free hand and switched on the light attached to it. My eye stung as sweat made its way inside. W and I were both out of breath, and we still had quite a long way back to go. After walking for about 20 minutes, A finally woke up. We stopped and asked him to explain what happened, but we were cut off by the sound of a branch snapping. W and I both trained our lights in that direction and saw the now familiar flash of gray just at the edge of the light. I turned in that direction and fired off three shots. We heard a growl and the sound of something big running away. We took that opportunity and booked it, if I had kept track of time and direction as well as I thought, we should be breaking through the trees in about 10 minutes. Then we should be able to see the light from the house. We ran through the pasture and made it to the fence. We crossed the street. I asked A to unlock the door to the house and he frantically searched his pockets for the key, but couldn't find it. He began to panic. W calmed him down and suggested he try a window. A being the smallest of us agreed. We went to the back of the house and managed to remove the AC from a window, which A then climbed through. He let us in, and the rest of the night was uneventful. I'm sorry for the anticlimactic ending to the actual story, but I do have more to say. The next day, we talked to the owner of the pasture where this happened. He found three of his cows dead and partially eaten. He also found a blood trail in the wooded area that led towards the house, then the opposite direction to the edge of his property. He also found A's keys on the ground where he had been knocked out and where we'd found him. 
The farmer explained that blood trail led to the land owned by an old hermit who lived in a trailer in the woods. He apparently never leaves and has relatives bringing him food. It's rumored that he messed with the occult in his younger days. We told the farmer what we experienced, but he didn't believe us, thinking we instead encountered a pack of rabid coyotes or feral dogs. None of us agree with that. So what could it have been? Was it a wolf-like cryptid? Was it a werewolf? A still lives in the same house, but he hasn't seen or heard anything like it since. Once again, sorry for the anticlimactic ending. The Thing The Stalker in the Shadows From Panda House I'm not the greatest at writing or storytelling, but I'll try my best. This happened several years ago. I think I was 17. I used to live on a large farm in the middle of nowhere. The nearest town was about half an hour's drive away. Our farm was surrounded by miles of dense forests. If you were to walk into those trees, the world around you would slowly disappear and the darkness would take over, swallowing you whole. When I was much younger, my dad would tell me stories about local kids that had gone into the forests alone at night. He would say that the kids were never found. I think at the time he was trying to scare me into exploring the woods alone. Now on our farm, I was in charge of all the smaller chores like feeding the animals, fixing things around the property, and a few other things I can't recall. My parents never did chores around the property on the weekdays. They were both out working in town. So during the weekdays, I was in charge of looking after the farm. Side note, this isn't important to the story, but you may be wondering about my schooling. I did school on weeknights and weekends. Anyway, one night both of my parents were working double shifts, so I had the whole house to myself for the night. I was so excited that I'd have the whole night to myself, I forgot my responsibilities to the farm. At around 10 that night, I remembered that I had to feed the horses, so I put on my heavy coat, because the temperature had cooled down fast and headed out to the horses. Now horses are very sensitive creatures. They can sense if you're near or who's near if they know you. They're also very good at reading emotion when you're worked up or calm. They'll get worked up with you, or be just as calm. So I was a bit concerned when I saw them freaking out in their pen. Normally, when I'm near, even when they're freaking out, they calm down a bit, knowing that I'm there. But not tonight. They were so upset that not even food did the trick. And my horses are the biggest gluttons ever. Usually. Since I couldn't get them to calm down, I decided to do a walk around the pen to see if I could find what's upsetting them. I found nothing unusual around the pen or in the barn. As I was exiting the barn and closing the big door, I turned around and I spotted it. This black creature standing in front of me. I was so scared I couldn't move. It felt as if my entire body was paralyzed. This creature was a big, black nothing. It had no facial features other than two black pits where eyes should have been. It was tall and slender with two large hands with razor-sharp talons. The two of us stood there, not moving a single muscle. But then something happened. That creature spoke to me in a dark, almost non-understandable voice but I know what it said. Run now. I did as instructed. I ran. I ran as hard as I could all the way back to the house. When I got back inside, I locked every door and hid in my closet with a knife in my hand. I didn't sleep that night. My parents came home later in the morning around noon, I think. It doesn't matter because when they walked in, I gave them the biggest hug I'd ever given them. I've only ever seen that thing again one more time. 
I was walking up the stairs to my house and I saw it at the end of the driveway when I turned back to lock my car. After a few more years at the farm, I moved far away for college, and I swore that I would never step foot on that property or town again. Don't hunt alone in the Ozarks. From that dude second. Before we get into what happened, I'll give some background info. I grew up in the southern part of the Ozark Mountains, spending most of my free time working on the farm or hunting and trapping. Now, you occasionally see things or hear things you can't explain, but most things you can brush off as coyotes or even the stray mountain lion. At the time of the first encounter, I was 16. It was a chillier November evening, and I was out hunting on my family's farm north of Hector, Arkansas. The spot I was hunting had an old logging road running down into the ravine, with a small hill behind me and a cliff face to my right. So darkness started to fall, and I finally got a deer with my muzzle loader. Anyone who has ever shot a muzzle loader can verify nothing ever hangs around after you shoot it. I instantly pulled out my phone to let the guys know I got one, when my arm hair began to rise. The deepest growl or yell bellowed from behind me as I pressed send. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Whatever it was, it was on two legs, and it was coming closer, but there shouldn't have been anyone for another two hills. This creature began to sniff before growling again. Hastily, I reloaded the muzzle loader and shouted, This is my farm. Leave, or I'll shoot. It growled this time at the base of my tree. Darkness had enveloped the entire block of woods now. I was trapped with a flip phone and a muzzle loader against something that I couldn't see. I could only hope the other guys were on the way. Then, I felt the ladder bending slightly, as if it was testing its weight. I pointed my flip phone light down and I saw two red eyes clearly. However, the lights from my family's side-by-side -side lit up the hill, and the creature ran down into the ravine as Levi and the others pulled up. After a few months, some weird things happened in the area before it finally went quiet. Less than a week later, one of the locals went missing along with his dog in the same area. To my knowledge, he still has not been located. For the next two years, I never hunted that area again. Please, never hunt alone in the Ozarks, because what you can't see is more terrifying than what you can. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence against pets. Also, please note, this story was originally posted under the True Mysterious Creatures category. To me, it is a great story, but it will sound unbelievable to many. I implore you to enjoy the story and choose what to believe for yourself. The Body Snatcher From Kiko When I was eight, I lived on a farm. It was large, bordered on two sides by an expanse of silver forest, a beautiful sight under the pale white moon glow, but nonetheless tainted by a pervasive eeriness. One side of it ran along an ancient beaten country road. Traffic was scarce on that road, and the nearest town was 30 minutes from the farmhouse. Every month, my father and mother left down that road in a broken down pickup and made for that town with what little money the crops brought in. On the last side of the farm was a break in the trees, a large circular crop of grass bordering an oblong lake with a small islet in the middle of it. The waters of the lake were murky, a dark green, but the lake moved hypnotically under the silver moonlight at night. It wasn't just my mother, father, and I on the farm. I had my brother, two years my senior, a dog named Jimmy, and a cat named Delilah. My brother George and I were always close, always sharing things, Tied at the hip, 
at least as my mother used to say. We went everywhere, and we weren't apart for longer than a minute, right up until the moment I lost him. One Sunday in March, my mother and father decided to ride out to town in the rickety old truck. They left in the morning, headlights shining out into the deep fog that had settled over the farm. My brother and I were alone that afternoon, watching television on the scratched and dusty tube TV in the kitchen, mindlessly eating cornflakes while Jimmy paced in the background. Then came the question, Mom and Dad shouldn't be back until this evening, right? George asked, almost apprehensively, his gaze never leaving the Sunday morning cartoons. I nodded. It was true that my parents had told us they were going into town for the day to see a rerun of their favorite movie and to have a nice dinner, a luxury we didn't have on the farm. George went on. We should... A pause. We should go swimming. Why would we do that? You know we'd get in big trouble if mom and dad found out. Plus it's dangerous. The water's deep and it's too foggy. I replied. Our one infallible rule on the farm was that the lake was strictly off limits. It's too deep, you'll hurt yourself, my parents repeated like a mantra. But I'd never needed it, because the lake unnerved me, and it always had. They've been saying that since we were little kids, but we're bigger now, much bigger. Come on, dude, it'll just be for a little bit, and we'll stay in the shallows. George was right, we were bigger. George himself was five foot six now, and the captain of the local basketball team. More importantly, I trusted George as my older brother. I agreed, apprehensively. A ball had formed in the pit of my stomach by the time we got to the lake. The two of us were dressed in the nice swimsuits my mother had bought us in town the year before. I could feel that nasty, writhing ball of guilt, nausea, and fear. I approached the lake, tentatively at first. My brother, not so much. Watch this, he yelled, sprinting for the greenish water. He leapt in, tucking in his body and landing in the water with a resounding floosh. A spike and ripple of foam and green appeared where he had broken the surface. I took a look behind my shoulder at Jimmy, pacing the shore with his nose in the air, taking in the sense of wildlife. Then I waded into the lake myself, but only as deep as my chest. The water was cold and murky and only the thin green film of the surface was visible. Wading deeper felt like moving through molasses, and each step I took brought me into contact with some slimy piece of the lake bottom. My brother, having the time of his life, swam over to me with a mischievous smile on his face. You'd better watch this. I'm going to swim over to the island, George boasted. I, I don't think that's a good idea, George, I said to him. We shouldn't be out here in the first place. What, are you chicken? George kicked off the bottom and swam toward the islet, passing well into the deep end. I looked towards the island, squinting through the fog. I thought for only a moment that I could see a pale, slimy shape slipping into the water. George? I called out. George, I, I think you should turn back now. I'm getting nervous. George stopped at the edge of what I could see and turned. His body was little more than an outline to me, but I could see him turning on the spot, trying to peer through the murky green water. Then, all heck broke loose. George was pulled under. Jimmy started barking. I couldn't move. Maybe it was shock or fear, I, I don't know, but I could only watch as Jimmy leapt in, paddling furiously for the spot George had been just a moment before. Then the retriever dove under, struggling with something, before George finally surfaced and sprinted towards me through the water. Something grabbed my foot. It was like a hand or something. George panted, stopping next to me. We need to go now. But where's Jimmy? We can't leave without Jimmy, I shouted, crying now. We turned and looked around at the fog line. I could tell George was preparing to swim out to find the dog when he suddenly surfaced and began paddling towards us. Relieved, we clambered onto shore and ran to the house, Jimmy at our heels, tail wagging the whole way furiously. We never told our parents about what happened that day at the lake. I didn't think any more of it until weeks later. 
The time following our lake encounter was stale in comparison. School and our duties at the farm marched ever onward, and I grew comfortable with life. My experience at the lake allowed me to tackle things I had never been able to before. I made friends with a local girl my age, with whom I played in the forest every so often, and I acted in a play at my school. June was different, though. You see, Jimmy got sick in June. Granted, he was an old dog, and sickness in elderly animals is expected on the farm. We had never taken him to a vet, after all, but it still broke my heart. I watched as his body deteriorated, and as he grew more sedentary, until he barely moved from his bed during the day. One night I awoke, for no apparent reason, to a cold chill. I looked over to my brother's bed. We shared a room, our beds placed neatly on opposite sides of the space, each facing the window. I then looked over to the open door, the hallway light shining a dull yellow onto the floor. I slipped out from underneath my covers and ambled to the opening to investigate. At the end of the hallway was a door to the outside, one of many that led to different parts of the property. This door hung open, a slight breeze pushing through it, moving my hair. Through the door, I could see the silver lake rippling hypnotically under the wind's influence. Suddenly, I heard a noise from behind me. Scrape, scrape, slop. Scrape, scrape, slop. I ducked around the corner and turned, peering into the hall. Jimmy came from the other end, dragging himself with his front paws, his claws leaving deep indents on the old wood. He stopped in the doorway and turned to face the room. I could see his body rippling, contorting under his mass of muddy brown, soaking wet fur. He stayed in the doorway for a moment, peering into the darkness as a puddle spread around him and he then began dragging himself once more, venturing into the room. I followed behind him, right up to the door, watching him weave through toys and clothes discarded about the floor. Then he stopped at the base of my brother's bed, and did something I wish I'd never seen. Jimmy writhed at the foot of George's bed, letting out soft whimpers and groans. His bones cracked, and his fur bulged around his scruff. Then it stopped. Jimmy's mouth opened wider than it should have been able to, his jaw cracking and crumpling, and a thin, bony hand protruded from it, fingernails digging into the soft carpet. The rest of the thing emerged from my dog, covered in his blood. Underneath, I could tell the thing was pale white, its skin covered in a slimy mucus, and it was tall. Standing at full height, it had to bend its neck to avoid hitting the ceiling as it towered over my brother. Slowly, with a sharp cracking sound every time it moved, it descended towards my brother, grasping his throat. The creature squeezed and squeezed, my brother writhing under its grip. I began to cry softly from my corner of the doorway, and the thing heard me. Its head snapped around to look at the door, and I moved back into the hallway, slamming my back into the wall with a thud and covering my mouth, daring not even to breathe. I heard the dull cracking as the thing stepped through the room and watched as its head protruded from the entrance of the room, its head facing the wrong direction to see me. It stepped back inside and finished its nasty work, choking my brother violently until finally, after some long minutes, it pried open his mouth and stepped inside. I watched what had been my brother's body, framed against the moonlight as it snapped, contorted, then went still. My brother rose from the bed and looked to the door, where I sat trembling with fear. His neck snapped to the window, and he leapt through it, breaking the glass, I stood and walked into the room, cutting my feet on the broken glass, watching as my brother sprinted on all fours into the forest. My parents ran into the room, demanding to know what had happened, but all I could do at the moment was mutter, it took him and Jimmy 
They're gone. And he was. They both were. I would never get my Jimmy back, and nobody would see George again. The police investigation concluded that an intruder had come through the back door, killed Jimmy, who had tried to stop him, and took my brother. I was left alone. I tried to explain what had really happened to the detectives, but my account was reduced to an overactive imagination in reaction to trauma. I went through therapy for 11 years. I was diagnosed with PTSD, and I'm no closer to the truth than I ever was. But here's my message to you. Listen to your parents. No rule is worth breaking. And be afraid of what lies in the deepest lakes, the darkest forests, and inside your own home. My brother, or whatever had him, is still out there, stalking through the undergrowth, hungry for its next victim, and I feel that it will keep taking victims as long as there are bodies to satisfy its hunger. Lock your doors. Bar your windows. Be afraid of the body snatcher. Thanks for stopping by our little campsite here at Outdoor Terrors. To hear your story on the show, send it to us at darkstories.org. For more scary stories from me, catch me on my other podcasts, Unexplained Encounters, and Tales from the Break Room on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Or go to eeriecast.com for those and even more terrifying podcasts. Follow me on X or Twitter at Dark Prevails. And if you don't mind, leave a rating for Outdoor Terrors on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Till next time, I'll see you soon when the campfire blazes once again.